This episode is sponsored by the Real Estate Foundation of BC. REFBC is a philanthropic organization that supports sustainable, equitable, and socially just relationships with land and water. Learn more about the foundation's grants and initiatives at refbc.com. My name is Chris Koo, and I am a nature photographer and the conservation outreach and uh, engagement worker for Birds Canada BC. Um, and for my work, I do communications and outreach. So that comes in many different forms, such as photography, videography, um, giving webinars, leading bird walks, and um, yeah, just general all things birds. <laughs> Amazing. Can you tell us about how, when did you become interested in nature or the environment? Mm -hmm. Because I think for some, we're so disconnected from it. And I'm just interested to understand when people make those tie-ins and when they start to go, like, this is so interesting. And for some, it's bees. For others, it's like uh, things that swim in the ocean. For you, it seems to be more nature and birds. And so could you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually grew up in Manila in the Philippines. And as with any young kid, I was obsessed with nature, dinosaurs in particular. And, <laughs> um, but the funny thing is, like back home in that city, there's little to no green space um, to explore as a kid. So the way I experienced nature was through like uh, TV shows on like BBC Earth or National Geographic or Animal Planet, and also just reading like a ton of books from the library about reptiles, amphibians, insects, fish, whatever they have. Because wow. <laughs> I was just so like curious and I really wanted to, um, yeah, experience nature, but I, I couldn't, like there wasn't a ton of space. So I did it through like various media like that. Um, and then for some reason, I just kept holding on to that. And <laughs> at some point um, back home, my dad, uh, got into birding because he saw an ad on a newspaper and it was like talking about all the different birds that we have um, uh, natively to the region and we thought the only birds that we had were like invasive house sparrows which we call mayas back home okay. um, so we're like oh there's other birds beside my mayas that's weird <laughs> um, so I picked up birding then and uh, unfortunately I dropped it a little bit when we moved to Canada because it was <laughs> which is my fault. <laughs> I was a little bit underwhelmed by like the birds here. Like they're not like, you know, bright yellow or red or blue <laughs> or green. I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> so oh. which is my fault because, you know, all the birds here have their own unique uh, beauty. So, but yeah. And then I was able to pick it up again, like 2019 through uh, bird photography, which I'm very grateful for. Interesting. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about growing up in the Philippines? That seems really interesting. And the fact that it was perhaps you didn't have as much access to nature made you more passionate about it. Can you tell us about what it was like to live there and perhaps moving into Canada and what that, that kind of change was like? Yeah, it was, um, it was very urban. Um, like, the famous pastime to do there is to like go to malls and um, like go shopping or things like that. Um, and it got quite repetitive to me as a kid because, you know, I got tired of like hearing tricycles like barrel down the road or jeeps or like air pollution and things like that. And so I always wanted to like escape to somewhere a little bit more natural and, you know, like look at bugs and birds and things like that. Um, and so when we moved to Canada, and I remember we first moved to Winnipeg and I just remember seeing like deer, like walking along the side of people's houses. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> Why is nobody freaking out? Um, or like bunnies or things like that. And yeah, cause it's just something I, I never experienced as a kid, right? Like there it's like a different mindset of seeing animals and wildlife as like resources to like consume. Um, Versus here, you know, it's a bit more, uh, there's a lot more like uh, respect to like nature and wildlife. Um, Interesting. Which is what I always thought was supposed, the way it was supposed to be. But back home, it was kind of a little bit odd. Like, you know, if, for example, uh, somebody finds a deer, you know, they're going to shoot it and they're going to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, 
but yeah, like that different sort of mindset was just like I was so happy like seeing deer around Winnipeg and just lots of green space. Yeah. Where d- where did your family move to from from the Philippines? What like what area and what called them to move here? Yeah, so yeah, we moved from Manila, which is the capital uh, in the Philippines, and then we first moved to Winnipeg, and we moved for a couple of reasons. Um, it was definitely for better opportunity for. Um, my parents thought, it was, you know, it's better opportunity for our family. I have two brothers and we were in, my eldest brother was in high school and I was also in high school then. And they just wanted something different for us because um, there's a little bit of like nepotism that goes on back home. So, you know, it's not necessarily how good you are as a um to, to get into a career it's more of like who you know or like your uncle knows this person or you know right. close friends with this person and yeah there's my parents didn't want us to like grow up with that and just kind of like those business dealings that go on and yeah they wanted something a bit better for us so that's yeah. amazing mm-hmm. and so winnipeg when did you end up is that why you weren't a huge fan of birds to begin with <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we first moved to Winnipeg because uh, we had relatives there and uh, they were the ones who sponsored us. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it was quite quite the change from like 40 degree, temp- you know, tropical rainforest sort of temperature. And then you can go to like negative 40 in the winter. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of snow. <laughs> and then what was the change? When did you move to BC? Uh, moved to BC in 2015, so we stayed in Winnipeg for about two years, and then uh, my parents decided um, there's like nothing for us to do here. <laughs> it's quite slow, and you know, coming from like a, a very busy city, we wanted some more opportunities, and so yeah, we moved uh, to BC in 2015. And what were those changes like? Did did it impact you at all? Like uh, we hear the term culture shock. Was the, did that affect you at all? Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. My family grew up, uh, well, we went to an all-boys Catholic school back home. So, and then we moved straight into public school when we went to Winnipeg. And back in my old school, they were very strict. Like, um, everybody had, like, standards for a certain sort of haircut. And, like, you know, can't touch, like, the top of your ear or, like, can't touch, like, the collar of your <laughs> of your uniform. And you have to, like, ask permission to um, drink water or stand up. Or Oh, my God. <laughs> it's quite strict. Drink water? <laughs> yes. Wow. I can understand, like, going to the bathroom one by drinking water. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. Um, so it was quite strict. And... Uh, I understand why they were like that. Like they wanted to instill like discipline into like uh, all these young boys. Um, but yeah, it was quite different. And then when I moved to Winnipeg, we I went to Sturgeon Heights uh, High School, and there were kids like putting their feet up on the table, and I was like, "What's going on here? <laughs> You're gonna get sent out to like the principal, right? Like that's something that will never be tolerated back home." So I was quite surprised. Interesting. Do you mm-hmm. did you in, like appreciate the the strictness? It's easy to think that like from my perspective, like that's crazy. Mm-hmm. But there is, and I've talked about this before. Like um, in Israel right now, they have the draft still. Um, there's challenges to making sure that people develop fully, that they have mm-hmm. a sense of discipline, a sense of responsibility, and that's one of the things I sort of worry about with with the people around me is that they're not being called to like take responsibility for perhaps the environment uh, for their family. Um, Many people are like, they want to move out. They want to leave their parents behind. Mm -hmm. But at some point in time, you're going to have to take care of them. They're they're the people who helped raise you. You're going to have to take care of them. And so that sense of responsibility, I think sometimes gets lost here in Canada. And I've talked to uh, Scott Sheffield, who's a military historian. And we kind of talked about like, how do we make sure that people develop, but in a way that's not nonsensical or unfair or in a way that's going to discourage them um, because not being able to drink water, that might be too far, but there needs to be some sort of discipline. So I'm just interested to know how that kind of shaped you. Yeah, um, that's a great question. (laughs) It's definitely, I don't think I would be the same person I am today if it wasn't for that sort of like education and formation. Uh, as strict as they were, um, they really did shape, well, they did their best to shape students to like be um, like a servant 
for others or uh, doing more than what is expected of you. So definitely very grateful for growing up with like those qualities. And I would definitely say like when I moved to Canada, like my qualities as a person has already been like solid solidified and I just kind of matured in this country. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of like um, being kind to others and like, um, you know, taking responsibility for your actions and things like that. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Cause I think that that's something that it's easy to kind of push off into the future, but when you do it, I don't, for me, I feel better when I'm making sure that if I wrong someone or if I came across the wrong way that I'm checking in and trying to make sure that, that I'm doing things correctly mm -hmm. because I don't want to, um, burn a bridge unnecessarily. I want to make sure that people feel understood and valued around me. But it does seem like a lot of those values come from more religious sides. And mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in like the overlap between um, my grandmother was a, was a Roman Catholic, um, but I'm indigenous. And so mm -hmm. trying to bring the two together to see what they were trying to teach, what kind of wisdom they were trying to share. Because I think uh, we often get lost in like intelligence. How smart are you? How did you do on that test? But how you treat people is far more indicative of like the quality of life you're going to live than just the the grades you get. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to see how religion shapes us, even if you're not practicing, even if you're not involved anymore. Those early developmental years seem to to imprint something on, on people. Mm -hmm. For sure. And yeah, I've always had that dilemma too. Like now that I'm... Um you know, been able to think about it more critically, like uh, the Spanish like came to our country and, and colonized uh, our indigenous people and converted them. And like, I've always wondered, like, what would have it been like if, you know, they didn't like convert everybody to Catholicism. But at the same time, I wouldn't be the same person I am today if it wasn't for them. So that's the complicated thing, right? Yeah, is, right. Um, I've sat down with Keith Carlson, who is interested in the history. And we talk about because there's this kind of tying together of what happened at Indian residential schools to the Catholic Church. And that it's complicated. And I talked to uh, Andrew Victor, who's a, a pastor about this, but he's also an indigenous pastor about like, is it, is it clear that the tenets of the belief system caused the problems or was it bad people? And I think Keith Carlson does a good job of kind of highlighting that these schools were set up in such a way that they attracted the worst kind of human being. Mm -hmm. You're going to be alone in the middle of nowhere completely unsupervised with children that calls certain people who have uh abusive tendencies who want to cause harm to children that that's like uh, a flag to them of like come over here there's no oversight for these children and so that was a problem just with the setup of it now i of course do not agree with indian residential schools to begin with but that is a, a complex problem as to why there was perhaps more sexual abuse in these schools in comparison to other schools is based on the setup of you're on a reserve in the middle of nowhere and so i'm just I don't want us to throw the the religious ideas, the 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 values that help people be a good person, with just like all religions are bad. I think that that's just a dangerous route to go down because the, every once in a while there's someone who get, like is really insightful on something that I didn't consider about the belief system, and I think we underestimate the values to our peril. But I used to be that person who was like, I don't need religion. That's silliness. That's superstition. And now I'm starting to appreciate it more. Yeah, for sure. No, that's a great way of like, um, yeah, pointing that out. And uh, yeah, never thought about it that way. And it's great analysis. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so when you come to BC, is that when you started getting back into, you, you went to Simon Fraser University. When did you realize that like biology and nature was the path for you? Um, well, I've always knew that I, uh, I was going to go into like biology and conservation in some way, shape or form. Um, like, yeah, like I mentioned, ever since I was, I was a kid, I was just obsessed with it and just never let it go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, coming into, like, going into SFU, I already knew that I wanted to be, like, some sort of, like, biologist. And so that was the path to pursue. 
And yeah, through my university experience, um, lots of different things arose, like podcasting, uh, as you mentioned, and uh, yeah, and just took on those opportunities. Can you tell us more about that? Because I think that university is often touted as like, this is where you go learn things. And for people who don't attend, for people who don't see themselves as university people, um, I always feel like that's unfortunate because they kind of, they're thinking of the tests, they're thinking of the studying, but you seem to have found a community of people with like-minded interests and I'm interested to know what that kind of educational journey was like because you figured out what your passion was but you also found a way to make it interweave with everything you did at SFU. Can you tell us about that? Yeah for sure. Um, yeah it can be daunting to get into university and you know just only think about the tests and like uh, the midterms that you know people talk to you about. Um, but Definitely for me, university was more for like a professional development. Um, I joined the co-op program as well. So I was able to get into a couple of like job opportunities and see what it's actually like. And the more I learned about like biology and what it, um, what you need to be like a, a good biologist, um, the more it became more of like a stats and genetics sort of uh, career. And that's something that I know is super, super um, critical and important, but I found that it wasn't really something that I personally find joy in doing. And so what I started to do was delve into like science communication and like talking about birds and like um, talking about insects and writing articles about people's research, which I found like really interesting and talking to researchers. And so I just kind of, uh, yeah, through my university experience, I just kind of started embarking on what I call like passion projects, um, things that, you know, you find uh, a need for, but no one's doing it. And so I, I jump on something like that or, yeah, I, I, I talk to different people and try new, new things out that are in the realm of biology, but not specifically the science itself. Interesting. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about what that was like? Like, what did you learn through your biology education? What did you sort of take away from it that built upon your passion? Yeah, the I would say the the thing that impacted me the most was learning about evolution. Um, so the, learning about the history of this planet and how like all the species we see today have come so far and like all these unique adaptations are a result of like 4 billion years of evolution and all the life that has been on this planet before is just incredible. And I remember sitting through like, you know, classes like that and where my professor was talking about, um, there used to be like giant insects during the Carboniferous and, you know, dragonflies the size of, you know, people. And I'm like, oh, why aren't we talking about that? That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, what that was like, there were giant bears too, right? They were just like all the species were crazy big. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, there were points in history where there's just massive animals like roaming around. <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, that would be fun to like talk about and research and kind of explore a little bit more. Does, did, do you feel like we talk about that enough? Like, what is your viewpoint on like our understanding of like, life's history? Uh, yeah, I definitely don't think we kind of appreciate it enough. Um, because as people, we're kind of concerned with ourselves and what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives, for example, right? Um, but if you look at like the grand scheme of things, we're here for like a blip <laughs> in like, the, the universe's history. Like, you know, Earth is been around for like 4 billion years and dinosaurs have been around for like <laughs> 300 million years or something like that. And like humans have only been around for like 200,000 years. And I saw in a documentary before where they described it as if you fit all of um, Earth's history onto like a 24 hour clock, where do humans fit? Just a few seconds before midnight. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's how like early and young we are in like this planet's history. And I think if people talked about it uh, more in like a larger scale, then we're able to appreciate everything more in nature, like how it's come to be and how we're ex existing with this current biodiversity and how we should be protecting and appreciating them more. Yeah, I have a suspicion mm -hmm. that we have like a like an increase in anxiety, an increase in depression, but I feel like a lot of that is because we're so disconnected from the things that 
re- remind us to stay humble. So like you took this amazing photo of like the night sky mm-hmm. and then you remember that we are like literally like a small little dot hurtling through space um, and just like the earth is spinning, mm-hmm. the sun is moving, like everything is moving around us and we're just kind of flying through space. And you can forget that if you're in an apartment and then you go to work in an office and then you go back to your, you can start to forget that we're just kind of flying through space. Yeah. You can start to forget about your role. Like one of the interesting things um, to me is people who believe in reincarnation. Um, it's not that, that that's not possible. It's just like, to me, the best way to look at it is like your kids are your reincarnation. Your kids are the, you can make, you can like try and help them remove all the baggage from your life. You can say, this is how I messed up. This is what I did wrong. This is what you shouldn't do because it was a waste of time and I was silly for trying this. And then you can say, these are all the things I did right. So utilize that knowledge and go do better. And they're like, they're you going into the future without all your mistakes. And I think that's just an optimistic way to look. But we all there, there's like this desire for us all to live forever. And I think that when, you, when you're when you striving for that or wishing that that were the case, you're forgetting that you have a role to play today, mm-hmm. that you can improve the circumstances of your children, of your community, of your family, of everything around you today. When you're wishing that things weren't going to come to an end, it seems like you're kind of neglecting that responsibility to how you treat other people, how you uh, shop if you're shopping the best you can and trying to be strategic in how you're purchasing. Um, You can forget all those things because you're wishing that it wasn't going to come to an end and you're kind of hedging your bets on that rather than let's assume that it's not going to go on forever, that you're just a blip in this time. But that that's an important blip. And there have been people, if you think back in history, you can think of a few names of people who played like a huge role in where we are today and the values that we carry and that we all kind of sort of take for granted today, like freedom of expression. Somebody had to come up with that idea and explain why that idea wasn't nonsensical. Um, Somebody had to come up with the ideas for like the values that we have today, like innocent until proven guilty. And so people played an important role and we rely on their knowledge from 100 years ago to do better today. And I think that that hopefully is inspiring to people that you are just a blip, but it's an important blip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, that especially comes up with people who um, uh, just don't want to deal with climate change, right? Like they say, well, I'm going to be gone, you know, in like this predicted amount of years and it's not really going to affect me. Um, But like that's so crazy. Yeah, the choices that you make today will affect the people who are going to live after you, which is even more important because you are shaping their future and, you know, they, they can't do anything about it. So... Um, yeah, that's something how people uh, kind of take away as well. Just, you know, it's a small fraction of, you know, the universe's history, but it's an important one that you're you're in it and what your actions matter and things you say matter. Yeah, I think that climate change conversation is just, it's uh, because we had that problem with the ozone layer, I think in the 1980s or 90s, that they actually ended up fixing. And the nice thing about it was that it was clear that there was a hole in the ozone layer. And everyone would could go, there it is. And I think even then, there were still people disputing whether or not it was actually happening. But it was it was simpler now we have this problem of like i f- i feel like a lot of the policies to correct climate change are falling more on individuals and i think the challenge that individuals have with that is they look at a giant corporation pouring out whatever pollutant and then they don't see or feel the same obligation on that corporation as they feel and that it's somehow disproportionate. And so there's this desire to push that back onto the corporation. And then it's it's like they don't want the responsibility anymore. And I think that that seems to be the challenge is that the conversation is more complex than I think any conversation we've had previously in regards to um, like people will say, well, you should switch your like gas vehicle to electric. And then another person will say, well, what about the batteries in electric cars? They're not perfect. And then it's like, you can just complexify. I don't think that's a word. Um, <laughs> you can make the conversation so complex as it like, it isn't clear what you can do. But, and then the, people try and simplify it down to like recycle, reuse, reduce, like don't waste stuff. And I think it's valuable, but it seems like we're just spinning our wheels in all these like, 
trivial questions of well was it was it this or was it that and i it just feels like i see so many people get lost in the minutia of the conversation that it's it's tough to get anywhere with this particular conversation i don't know if that's true with i don't like you think of the cold war i don't know if it's true with all problems mm-hmm. but it seems like that's where we're at right now is so many people are on board but then there's a whole other group of people who aren't on board and it's like they're they're trying to make the compli- the situation so complex that they don't want to do anything yeah for sure and yeah it's just unfortunate that uh because climate change is so complex and you know emissions come from like literally everything we do yeah. um there's a lot of like fingers like going around like pointing at other people for uh, the responsibility mm-hmm. that's a really good way of putting it just mm-hmm. fingers being pointed rather than just kind of taking that responsibility on mm-hmm. so f- when you were with um SFU you were part of some clubs and stuff can you tell us about how that impacted you Yeah, I was part of a couple clubs at SFU as well as um research uh labs. Um it was really great to able to like talk to researchers and like-minded people about um things that I was passionate with. Like uh when I was you know, when you're in like elementary or high school, not everybody's into like snakes or beetles, right? <laughs> They're like, "Oh, that's kind of weird." <laughs> Especially as a teen. Um so it's good to like join uh those groups and clubs and have you know people completely nerd out over like <laughs> the same things that you do. Um and it was also a great way to like make connections and learn about like what it's like to do research as well and uh what it takes. Can you tell us about what kind of research you're talking about cuz for some people they've never done research before. They don't know what the process is or what or what that may look like at a university. Yeah. Um So most of my uh professional experience in biology is with insects. Um and a lot of like the research that we do involve like conservation or management of uh insects at least in the labs that I went to. And it was really uh an eye-opening experience to learn that, like how important data is. Um when I was working in uh, agriculture and agri-food Canada in Summerland um a research technician Tyler was telling us that data sets have to be like 30 years old to be robust enough to be analyzed and to have like meaningful um <laughs> meaningful results and that's just crazy to me right again because you know we kind of think in like these smaller uh, human lifetime scales um but it's true that if you're trying to study something long term you need a uh, a really broad range of data to be able to determine like if it, if a species is actually declining or if it's like expanding into a place that we don't want it to um instead of just taking like five years worth of data right right that makes me think of the the pine beetle um oh i think it's an invasive species mm-hmm. um i don't know what happened to that i feel like we were worried about it taking over all our forests I haven't really heard anything about that. Since. Yeah, the mountain pine beetle kind of disappeared as well. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, but yeah, it was a story about uh it's actually not invasive. It's it's oh, okay. native to to um to our province. Um but just the fact that because it is getting warmer, um the beetles are able to survive longer and like prey on a lot more uh of our, our trees and right. like evergreens. Um and yeah we haven't really heard much about that like other things going on in the news like murder hornets. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting conversation I had on the murder hornets. That was yeah. that's crazy. Um I'm glad to know that they're not thriving that it looks like we've eradicated them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, to call something a murder hornet is just terrifying. Yeah, um I think that's mostly the media, right? They they want to uh, get like headlines and story grabbers and things like that. But, uh, yeah, Paul uh, Van Westendorp who I spoke to about it. He did a great job of kind of summarizing um how like the US had one patch of them and that's where a lot of the media came from and then it got blown up into a big story mm-hmm. and they love reporting on those types of things and yeah, it's mm-hmm. just interesting to hear somebody be like, yeah, no, everything's fine. There's no reason to be concerned. And and then you watch the news and it seems like we're all going to get eaten alive. Yeah, for sure. Um but yeah, I the the photos and videos that came out of uh, that story was pretty cool though. Like <laughs> some gear that, you know, you won't see people wearing like really thick <laughs> suits and like these canisters full of like um the hornets. It's pretty cool. 
Yeah, he mm-hmm. Paul explained that they sent people because um, there was one found on in Nanaimo, and so they sent a person in knowing that they weren't going to kill them all. That they wanted to preserve them to figure out what they were, where they come from, and it was just interesting to know that there's a person who had to go in, knew they were going to be stung by a potentially like killer bee and killer hornet. He would not like me saying killer mm-hmm. bee, killer <laughs> hornet, and. That person was like, I'm fine with it because I've been stung before by other things. And it's like, I don't think normal people could handle that job. Yep. <laughs> you definitely have to be used to getting stung by uh, insects like that. Mm-hmm. Would you say that you're interested in all life or do you lean towards, um, you were talking about like working with bugs and now you work more with birds. Is it all of it or do you have preferences? Um, I'm trying to get better with just knowing and liking all of them um but i definitely am a little bit biased towards birds <laughs> and bugs <laughs> uh for sure but yeah i think uh i can't like just glorify one group because they're all just so wonderful and they have all their own unique adaptations and life histories and you know i don't want to overlook all of that so yeah just uh getting to know more about like different groups and tax are, are super interesting to me and um, yeah. Well, let's start with uh, bugs then, because I spoke to um, Eddie Gardner, and he identified bugs as the ones that crawl. And as I've said before, I don't know if he's doing that uh, deliberately to like, bugs is almost used as like a word of like, get that thing mm-hmm. off me and like, don't bug me. Like we've used it as like a derogatory term. So him saying the ones that crawl instead showed more respect. And I think that that's really interesting. So can you tell us about some of the bugs you've studied and, and what you saw that was interesting about them? Yeah. Um, insects are so interesting. They are the most like diverse group of, uh, of animals on the planet. And uh, beetles alone have like, five uh, i'm missing the figure but in the hundreds of thousands of species oh my gosh uh, which is crazy <laughs> funny story when um when darwin actually was first writing up um his his work on evolution and there was a contradiction you know with people saying oh this is not aligned with the creation story on the bible he said oh then god must have like an infinite fondness of beetles because there's just so many of them like so many different types <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was involved in kind of butterfly research, uh, at SFU, um, with, uh, the now Dr. Jamie Luthwaite. She was a PhD student before, um, and was super cool. We, she was looking into how butterfly species, um, ranges were like expanding or contracting, um, because of climate change and ranges as in how far they can fly. Yes. Or like how far they're kind of observed or, uh, detected. So yeah, a couple of species, most species were like expanding because it's getting warmer. So a lot of like species you'd see, um, normally in like lower, uh, more temperate climates are starting to move up into the Arctic because it's, it's getting warmer over there. Um, so yeah, that was really cool research. Um, and we, we had an opportunity to try and, um, capture some Mormon metal marks in, uh, the Okanagan because they were endangered and we wanted to see like if they were viable for captive breeding. Um, what what did you just say? Uh, Mormon metal marks, they're kind of butterfly. Oh, <laughs> yes. wow. What type of butterfly are these? Um, they're just kind of like um, orange, uh, grayish butterflies. Okay. Um, and they, they feed specifically on like uh, rabbit brush, I believe. Um, and so there's only a few patches left in the Okanagan because most of it is kind of developed into agriculture. <laughs> And so it, that's why the, the butterfly was declining because they're quite specialists to like these particular plants. And it's the Morgan... Mormon metal mark. Mormon melon mark. Metal, metal mark. Metal mark. Yeah. M- Mor- Mormon metal mark. <laughs> yes. I just realized it's a weird name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to like figure out how I would say that fast. The yes. fact that you did was very impressive. Yes. Um, but yeah, that was super interesting. Um, 
Yeah, those those guys were difficult because they were quite small and um, they hide really well um, around like the sagebrush and things like that. Interesting. So you would since they're declining and they might be, it sounds like endangered, mm-hmm. um, and that's due to agriculture. And I think again, uh, it's just interesting to like understand that building these monocrop spaces is a real is a real challenge. Um, when I talked to Paul Van Westendorp, one of his arguments to save bees, because we we still see dwindling bee populations um, in lifespans, that was one of the challenges he was talking about. They're not living as long, mm-hmm. and they're not as effective as they once were. So we're having to breed even more of them that die faster and don't live as long and are less effective. And one of his solutions for cranberry and blueberry farmers was to just leave a patch of the space. Because bumblebees, this was crazy. Bumblebees don't communicate with each other. They Honeybees do a dance in their hive. You knew, Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm just the only person who didn't know that and still thinks that's crazy. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> yeah. So honeybees dance, um, but bumblebees don't. So they just kind of go out everywhere and don't know where they're going. And he was like, well, if we put just like patches, leave the the plants there so that the the bumblebees can have a place to go all throughout the season, then they'll survive and they they won't die. And then you'll be able to use them for longer term. Mm-hmm. And then the farmers, from what he said, were like, no. Because that's a waste of my patch of farm, and I can, I can maximize. And it's like you like we talk about like biodiversity, and then when there's like a tangible step, and then the people are like, no, because I don't make money off of that. And it's like right, but you're saving the planet from losing these butterflies or these bees, or like you're making our world more effective and more biodiverse. Like that that word seems like it's it's growing. Maybe you can define that for people. Yeah. Um, no, just to touch on that, um, it's definitely um, yeah a challenge to try and kind of like pitch this to people who want to make money off like their land, right? Especially in like developing countries where they're just trying to make a living and then you have all these organizations saying, hey, you should like plant other stuff around here. And they're like, well, you know, who's going to pay me for that? And so therein comes a challenge, you know, you have to like pay a premium to these people who are actually doing good. And so it's not just getting, you know, the land isn't just getting wasted to them. Um, um, But yeah, I think we definitely need to think more holistically about um, biodiversity, which is just uh, essentially all the life um, that's kind of defined in a given place or region. And we have to move away from just, you know, growing monoculture and thinking about it just in like the dollar value because... Uh, as you know, ecology is like all very intertwined and all the species depend on each other for uh, for survival and for growth. And so we can't just kind of cut that sort of um, process away and just have something that will benefit us like specifically, right? Um, so, yeah. That is super interesting. Mm-hmm. And so after the butterflies, did you do any other research? Because this is just super interesting to learn about, like the research of, of bugs and life. Because the other one that's really interesting is like how that fungi takes over, I think, is it is it ants? I think it's ants. I like the biology is very interesting. It is, yeah. And especially at like the insect scale, because everything is so diverse there. Like, um, it's not like with birds, for example, you look at a bald eagle and you say, that's a bald eagle because it's got a white head and like yellow beak and it's like this size, it's large. Um, but with insects, because they're so diverse, like from species to species, the differences might just be like a little structure and like under the wing. And that makes it really difficult to like properly define like how many there are, like how diverse they are. That's why it's also difficult to manage um uh, pest insects because their genetics are so diverse. Like if you try to target one population, um, somebody's going to have like a different gene that, you know, um, is able to um, survive like a certain pesticide and then they're going to like start reproducing. <laughs> and oh, so wow. that's why it's like continuously, people are continuously making like um, stronger and stronger pesticides, right? Um, because the insects are just so diverse and it's just, yeah, they're able to adapt to almost everything. <laughs> yeah, that was one thing that Paul explained as well, which was like, we have this instinct to spray everything just to just to be safe. Mm-hmm. But what he was saying was that there are actually like birds and, and other bugs that eat 
the dangerous bu- or like the harmful bugs that are causing a problem. And so it's only when that relationship becomes out of sync and there's more harmful bugs than good bugs that you need to spray, that you need to take action. But the instinct, because it's easy, is to just spray all the time. And I was, mm-hmm. uh, that just blew my mind of like, I would want to just spray. Like my instinct would be like, I don't want to go look for bugs to figure out what the relationship is. Like mm-hmm. that, that lazy side of people seems to have a lot of consequences. Yeah, for sure. And when I was working uh, in Summerland again, I was working in a biological control lab, which essentially means we're using natural predators and like parasitoids to contr- to manage. I want to move away from using control because right. we can't really control uh, pests. We're more like managing the populations um, because there will always be some sort of pest uh, around. If you have like a field sort of like really good crops it's like a candy you know candy store to like a kid there of course they're going to come and pick on something um, which is how we chose to grow uh, our crops and so it's more of like managing the amount of pests in like a particular place not just like controlling them or eradicating them and through the research in our lab we were using um are you familiar with parasitoids no they are specialized wasps that lay eggs on uh particular insects so it's kind of like that movie Alien, where, um, for example, there we have like um, uh, lots of fly, like fruit fly species that that you know eat blueberries and crops like that. And so what we have are parasitoids that we release in, in the same environment, and the parasitoids will lay their eggs um, on the fruit fly eggs, and what emerges out of those eggs are parasitoids, like other wasps, not. Um, not the pest insects. And so it's like this interesting sort of control where you're not spraying anything and you're just using like nature's natural um, predators and parasitoids to like manage that pest population. Hold on. Are you saying Mm -hmm. for all the people who hate wasps, (laughs) are you saying the wasps actually contribute? Because that's that's the knock that I've heard on them is like wasps don't um, like make honey. Wasps don't do these things. Mm -hmm. Can you could you elaborate? Yeah, um, there's tons and tons of species of wasps. And I think most people, you know, have like this negative attitude towards them because of the yellow jackets, um, which are the most common ones. And, you know, they typically can sting you, um, They're sometimes a little bit aggressive. Um, But wasps are definitely beneficial to like uh, ecology because they manage a lot of like insect populations. And especially with things like um, pest management, you know, you if you like eating blueberries, you know, it's nice to have wasps around because they're they're getting all the pests that are eating your blueberries. Ah, every time I think that there's something I know, then like wasps are a good thing. I keep yeah. learning more. It keeps mm-hmm. blowing my mind. Um, mm-hmm. who was, I watched a documentary with a UBC professor, mm-hmm. and she was explaining that like trees, this is when like I just threw out like, because we, we don't say it, but we walk around with this attitude like I'm a person, so I'm better than a tree. Like I'm more valuable than a tree. Mm -hmm. And then um, Susan Simard, who's a mycologist at UBC, and I think she's written a book and she was on a Netflix documentary called Fantastic Fungi. Mm -hmm. And she was explaining that trees communicate with each other through mycelium Mm -hmm. and that like one tree can feed like its offspring tree um, and like move nutrients towards it through the mycelium. And actually like when the tree is growing, it can actually push the tree farther away to get away from it. It was blowing my mind. And then it was like, it's a tree. Like my, my part of me that thought I was so smart and that I've got this brain was like, no, like this is. <laughs> I thought I knew things, yeah. and so every every time I think that I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stop thinking I know more than nature. Then you explain something to mm-hmm. me that throws every, my little bag of knowledge out the window. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah, that yeah, you know, things like that completely blow our minds because again, we're you're just such a young species on this planet, and you know, all these other organisms have had millions of years to evolve, and so they have all these really cool and unique adaptations that uh yeah we normally just take for granted or just look over you know like it's just a treat you know (laughs) yeah we like we're taught like be confident and it's like but you don't know 
anything. Like, you know almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Even with, like, when you start to learn something, you just realize how complex, like, bugs are. And we start to get into this rhythm of, like, I got this life thing figured out. I got my job. I got I got my money coming in each mm -hmm. month. I got this house. I, I've got life figured out. And then you go into the forest and you're like... Never mind. Mm -hmm. There's fungi, there's birds, there's bees, there's there's a whole ecosystem of things that all interact with each other. And to try and understand it, like you, when you want to know something within the scientific realm, it's like you narrow in on this like one little thing that's a unique fun fact about like this one thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're like an overall expert in like all of life. There's the, the, that's not a job. Yeah, and that's I think that's what makes nature and natural history just so exciting, right? Like there's all these awesome, unique stories and adaptations that you know we know very little about, and we're just starting to explore. Interesting. So mm -hmm. when did you start working with birds? When did you start to make that, that shift over from from the the bugs to the the birds? Yeah. So that was in uh, 2019 when I got a pre pretty decent paying co-op job <laughs> and um, I remember seeing on Instagram like all these um, wildlife photos which uh, I've always admired and I was kind of discouraged not to try because you know oh there's so many experts around here like I know nothing about this subject and um, how, did you, how did you overcome that? Because that's the instinct that I feel like yeah. I had with this was like, I'm not an expert. Like, I don't know how to interview people. There's mm -hmm. people out there who are better than this. So how did you yeah. overcome that? For sure. And, you know, it was just kind of a leap of faith where, you know, I like, I want to, you know, I want to try this out. And so with some of the money I was making, just bought like um, lenses on like uh, Craigslist or Marketplace and just started testing them out and taking photos like, bunnies like invasive bunnies in my local park <laughs> and just like looking like a complete fool just lying on the grass <laughs> there's probably like geese poop all over the place but i remember like that particular shoot in like june of 2019 i was just so happy <laughs> that's good <laughs> i was just so happy and i was like wow this is amazing it feels like you know i was looking through i was looking at like a lion in the savannah or something where it's just like a you know a bunny on like the grass <laughs> in my park <laughs> um but yeah so when did you start going out? So did you just start taking photos on your own? Um, and then you moved into like a role with, with Birds Canada. How did, how did you start getting more interested in birds? Yeah, so I started with the photography thing. And actually, you know, lo there's lots of birds around. And I just started taking photos of them and trying to ident identify them through like iNaturalist or just looking back and sorry what's iNaturalist? iNaturalist is a um, citizen science app okay. where you can take photos of like plants, animals, bugs and you upload it to the app and it identifies it for you uh, using AI and it's confirmed by other members of the community and saying like okay this is correct you know what you photograph is a black capped chickadee um, and that's also used for uh, citizen science data um, which is amazing it's a great app um, and I just threw like a couple of my pictures on there and I started figuring out, oh, like this is a red winged blackbird or this is a song sparrow. And so that's how I kind of found my love for birding again. Like, oh my gosh, I remember when I was younger and I was obsessed with like those field books from back home. And so I just started taking photos and eventually a uh, position opened up uh, at Birds Canada where, you know, they needed a communications and outreach person. And I was like, oh, I did some of that at SFU and I'm taking photos now. So I think it'll be like a good fit. Amazing. Can you tell us what a citizen scientist is? Because I think that that is so inspiring for people who like... We have this weird thing, again, where like if you go to university, you know, and if you don't go to university you're treated like you don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that that is such a terrible, terrible way to like teach people about how to live. Like if you're interested in cooking, you don't have to go to an Ivy League baking place or cooking place in order to be make like delicious food. And so the same applies with science. The same applies with, um, I think that there's a, a, a scientific app for like identifying fungi and it sounds like for birds mm -hmm. and you can find these communities and start to be interested in something that maybe like uh, my partner, she attended school for um, high school and she didn't feel like she was like a natural sciences person because her teacher didn't make the topic accessible to her. So she's like, I don't like nature. I don't like like science. And it was like, that can't be true. Because when we're on these walks, she's like, what kind of grass do you think that is? What kind of bird do you think that is? What kind of, and like, you can tell she's interested, but this one teacher in high school made her feel like she was not intelligent 
on this topic. So she was like, this isn't for me, I guess, because I'm my teacher said I'm not good at this, so I must not be good at this. And so when people are able to find these apps that allow them to join a community and start humbly taking an interest in it, I think that's inspiring. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, citizen scientists? Yeah, for sure. Um, citizen scientists are really, really important um, because, as I mentioned, data in science is, is very critical into, like, making really meaningful research. And the fact of the matter is, is that scientists can't be everywhere all the time collecting data. And so we rely on people who are, you know, go on walks every day or visit parks every day to kind of record their observations and upload them to citizen science apps. And then we can use that uh, for our research and data analysis. And so it's really critical for determining um uh, you know, natural changes over time or presence, absence of like a particular species in a region um, that otherwise wouldn't be um, reported if a scientist, you know, didn't live in like a remote place, for example. So that's like when we talk about like people being good stewards of the land, when we talk about people making a positive difference, do you think that this is something we could start pitching to the general public? Is like if you walk this trail every day, Grab out your phone. And when you're taking those photos, just upload them. Share them with us so we have a little bit more data. Maybe it doesn't change our understanding of how science is done, but you're contributing in, in a small way. Um, just like when you make a small donation to the Salvation Army when you're picking up your food. It's just a, it's just a different way people can think about making a contribution. Yeah, for sure. And the way data works is that the more you have of it, um, the less significant errors in in um, in the data will be. So for example, if you flip a coin twice, uh, the chances of you getting like uh, heads or tails, um, you know, will be significantly biased versus if you flip a coin like a thousand times, right? It would be more 50-50 yeah. versus um, flipping it only twice. And so like all those small changes will kind of disappear in the background if you have a like, really big and robust data set. And so having more data is, is really beneficial to um, all of the research that we're doing. And then it'll help with things like conservation because there are various areas, uh, Blackie Spit included, that's been working to, um, for people who don't know, Blackie Spit is in Surrey. And one of the challenges I think they were trying to address is like people were walking so much all over the park that they were just killing everything by like stomping their feet all over it and then that was having a negative impact on the biodiversity because life wasn't able to grow normally because you put down your bag and you put down your uh, towel and then all of a sudden like all this life can't thrive there mm -hmm. um, i could be incorrect could you tell us about blackie spit and what was kind of going on there no that's uh that's definitely correct um it's very um high use area like lots of people walk around the trails and like to sit around beaches uh even though there are some signs that say you know like some birds are nesting here please don't you know wander off trail um but unfortunately yeah it's uh, that's what's happening uh over at that site um and like lots of other sites as well on, across the lower mainland. Um, but if people could be a little bit more respectful to the environment, of course, and just kind of let's all work to like preserve the, the habitat, um, that would make a big difference. Yeah, I just think that it's cool because we do have all these, uh, like I know Save on Foods just switched over all their plastic bags to paper bags. Um, we're doing a lot in regards to changing things, but I think that can bug people sometimes. Like now, like you have to carry your bag out in a different way. And so like those changes, people kind of go, oh. <laughs> and so when we can have something that's like positive where it's like your photos can be used for good, it can be more inspirational and we can start to address some of that. And like, I know that people are interested in, in doing good in the community. And I, I know that with Chilliwack particularly, there's like picking up garbage groups. And I think that that's so important, like it's inspiring, but it's so important that we have this mindset of like, nobody else is going to clean it up. It's us. It's, it's you or nobody. Mm -hmm. And then you've seen the footage of like birds getting like stuff wrapped around their neck. Mm -hmm. And like, um, I think there was like a turtle with like a straw, like in its throat, like mm -hmm. terrible things if you don't do it. And so it's worthwhile to pick up the garbage, but also take photos. And so many people love taking photos that it would be cool to see like signs put up of like, consider uploading your photo of the birds to this. Mm -hmm. The only challenge I guess that you could run into is people going off trail to try and go and get those photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of an issue as well in, uh, um, in bird photography, because there's some really 
productive sites um, uh, across the Fraser River Delta, where uh, lots of birds kind of migrate from uh, the Arctic. They come down to our coast because it's mild and nothing really freezes over. And so it's a great spot for them to like rest um, and forage for the winter. And uh, unfortunately, there are some photographers who are just really keen on getting those photos. Um, and they just kind of like wander off trail. And uh, sometimes it's a group of them like walking around, um, which is really not the best scenario for um, for the wildlife that come down here to rest. Can you tell us about bird migration just generally? I have mm -hmm. very little understanding. Something about flying south for the winter, flying north for the winter. I don't remember. Yeah. I remember very vaguely. If you could explain <laughs> yeah, how course. birds migrate. Yeah. So um, here in the north, uh, here in Canada, at least, um, we have a lot of species from Central and South America that um, migrate up to our province uh, when it gets warmer because there's plentiful insects that kind of um, start emerging during the warmer months. And there's like lots of nesting opportunities around here. Um, and then once it gets cold here, typically in the, like the fall, let's start heading, heading back down to like Central and South America because that's where more food is. Like more, it's warmer, they can survive there. How far is that flight? Uh, it depends on the species. Um, but the Arctic tern, for example, flies from the Arctic to Antarctic every, like twice a year, I believe. The Ar yes. <laughs> the whole planet, basically. Yes, from like north to south. They fly that. How do they have enough food? That's a, that's a trip. That's a great question. Um, because there's lots of uh, species that kind of stop in particular spots or areas where they have to refuel. And so, for example, in the Fraser River Delta, uh, Brunswick Point is a very important site for Western sandpipers uh, because um, the there's a vast mudflat there where biofilm grows. And we, um, that's like their primary source of really high... Um, long chain fatty acids that kind of um, fuel their migration up to Alaska. And so this is one of those few spots where they're able to like really bulk up and have enough energy to like move to the Arctic. And so uh, it's important to preserve habitats like that because if you take that away, they're not going to have enough energy to breed in, in the Arctic and to like make that long distance migration. That's near Tawasin, right? Yes. I mm -hmm. think I just read an article by Tawasin First Nation that they have the first right of refusal to buy back that land there. That is super interesting. Mm -hmm. Brunswick Sound, you said, right? Uh, Brunswick Point. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the surrounding water around it, I think that they're interested in reclaiming. That is really interesting. And so what do they have to eat? You said fatty acids. Uh, biofilm, yeah. The, the biofilm itself have um, fatty acids in them. So that's... What's a biofilm? Biofilm are like little diatoms, which are little organisms that produce energy from uh, through photosynthesis. And what makes this site so special is that when during the springtime, when fresh water um, runs down to the mouth of the Fraser at Brunswick Point, it stresses out the, the, the biofilm and they start producing long chain fatty acids, which is um, which is, you know, then consumed by the Western sandpipers. And, you know, this is one of the few only sites where that actually happens. And so it's really critical for them. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's how this is delicate. Because if they don't have that, then they can't go to Alaska, you said. Yes, Copper River in Alaska, I believe. Yeah, which They have like a specific spot. Yes, quite a, quite a ways up there. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. So, like, why do they go up there from, like, why do birds migrate? Like, why do they move so much? Why don't they, like, people are like, why don't they just hang out here? It's, it's all good. Yeah, so birds migrate for uh, typically resources and nesting opportunities. And the way migration has evolved was through um, climatic changes in, uh, in Earth's history. So, uh, for a lot of the songbirds, for example, when... Uh, the glaciers started retreating, uh, the birds started, you know, moving uh, along with the glaciers and like staying in like the habitats that suddenly become uh, open. And so through, you know, thousands and thousands of years, they started to like make those migrations and um, it just becomes uh, part of their life history. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So with birds, they're flying. 
all around, I'm interested to understand, like, what makes them continue to travel these distances, but how do they know? How do they know where to go? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of theories around that, but the uh, one of the, the more um, popular ones is that they're using the Earth's uh, magnetic field to kind of determine... Uh, which direction they're going. And so uh, something instilled in, I believe, their brains that they're using um, that kind of, you know, guide them towards a specific place. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you can... People who are woo-woo, that, like, that speaks to the woo-woo people mm -hmm. who are like, there's, like, an energy around us that's, like, impacting us. Mm -hmm. Because then the question is, like, are we able to tap into this this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's a great question that I have not explored. <laughs> it's just like, because like, I believe that. And like my understanding is that like a lot of different creatures operate that way. But it's so interesting to think of like, like traveling all around the world and being able to follow something. Because that's what fish do in the water, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're traveling long distances. Uh, like how does a salmon know to swim back up river, even though it's going to die? Like on that last trip up, it's gonna die, but it's still trying to make the run. Like what, what ingrains that into them to just continue this cycle and to know where to go? Um, do birds know each other? Because uh, we hear, is it crows that are like super smart and mm -hmm. people like to think of as really smart because they remember people's faces? Um, how do how do birds know each other? Um, uh, again, it depends on like the group or, or species. Some birds are more solitary than others. Um, some birds, uh, they have, they have partners that they mate for, for life with. Some have, you know, um, multiple partners throughout a breeding season, for example. Um, but you mentioned like crows and like that group of birds, like crows, jays, uh, which we call like the corvid, uh, group, like magpies are quite intelligent birds and they do recognize people's faces and each other and they're quite vocal and, and they're social as well. Interesting. Mm. Magpies. Do we have those here? Yes. In the Okanagan, we've got black-billed magpies. Um, very beautiful bird. Got long, very yeah, gorgeous tail. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so what made you interested in birds? What gives you, what do you think gives you this little bit of a bias towards mm -hmm. bugs and birds? Well, for birds specifically. Yeah. Um, I think it has to do with a couple of reasons. So the first one is just that they're so... Um, they're everywhere and they're ubiquitous and it's easy, very easy to get into like birding and observe birds and um, yeah, like any green space that you go, there's probably going to be some sort of bird around there. Um, uh, the second one is that they're just so diverse, um, like from owls to like albatrosses, they've, they've all got their unique adaptations. Um, and the third one I would say is their incredible life history and adaptations. You know, um, I learned recently that there are species of albatross that th don't get their like full adult breeding plumage until they're 18. So they're like humans. <laughs> really? Yeah. How long do they live for? Great question. The oldest known living bird is actually a Laysan albatross. She is 70 years old and her name is Wisdom. And... What? Yes. <laughs> what? She's 70 year old bird. Yes, yeah, she's 70 years old and she's uh, forgetting the figure off the top of my head, but she's had a number of chicks already. Um, but albatrosses are such an interesting group of like seabirds. You know, once they leave um, their nesting island, like some of them don't see land for like three years. They're just like wandering the ocean. Um, <laughs> and so we don't even know if this is the oldest. We're just, because this one is the oldest, we're like... Yes, that's so, the oldest one we know of, at least, yeah. The one that's tagged, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so, is there different types of birds, like generally, like the genres of birds? Yes, there's definitely different types, you know, we've got like eagles or raptors, we've got like owls, we've got seabirds, you've got like wading birds. Okay, we gotta, birds. we gotta slow down. Yes. <laughs> so, let's start with raptors, because mm -hmm. these are the ones that people just love an eagle or seeing a hawk. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's something special to us to see that. You said the raptors, could mm -hmm. you, could you tell us more? Yeah, so raptors are what we call uh, birds of prey, and they're typically, um, they've got like a large, uh, like heavy built 
feature to them. So like a hook bill and then like really strong, powerful legs with talons to like kind of grab other birds and other prey. Um, and yeah, they're top of the food chain and lots of other birds are typically scared when they see a, a, a raptor around. Um, you see lots of small birds like mobbing. Um, it's a behavior that we call where like other birds, smaller birds kind of fly up to a raptor and like stop pecking at it or like chasing it away from its territory. Um, it's very interesting to watch, and they're <laughs> they're very brave little birds. Oh my gosh! So like <laughs> that, what they want to scare away the raptor, and they so do. their way to kind of beat them is on at scale, like having a bunch of them all attack at once. Yeah, for just sure. very minor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just yeah, just annoy the heck out of the raptor. If I was a bird, I wouldn't want to be a raptor because I would constantly get mobbed. <laughs> Is that it's common then? Yes, it's quite common. Um, owls, uh, especially, um, they like to hide a lot and be discreet because uh, once you know birds find them, like uh, crows, for example, they will not stop harassing the owl. They'll just keep cawing at it and until it flies somewhere else or goes somewhere else. And uh, yeah, that's why do, owls. Do mm. owls usually attack crows though? Not really. So, um, like, what causes the mo like? Yeah, they just they just know it's a raptor, and um, owls can take like you know smaller smaller birds. For example, if a crow had young, um, then it would be more viable prey. Um, but a lot of birds just know that raptors are just no good, and they prey on other birds, and they don't want them around, and so they're constantly harassing them. <laughs> Yeah, because you can't really do that with, like, a grizzly bear. Like, yep. a small mouse is not going to go, like, we'll all attack the grizzly yep. bear all at once. So it's sort of unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. and It's very interesting to see. Interesting. How strong, We I think this is usually talked about in books, but how strong are the raptor kind of family? Like, their talons can pick up, like, a salmon moving in a river pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Um... Back home, we have the Philippine eagle, uh, which will snatch a monkey out of a tree. Uh, and I know in South America, they have harpy eagles that snatch sloths out of trees. And so it's even more crazy to me. Like, just imagine you're going about your day and you're getting, you know, pulled away. <laughs> Especially at the pace a sloth moves. Like, by the time yeah. it realizes it's been moved out of a tree, it's like mm. in the air. Like, it's not like a <laughs> <It's> fast. <so sad. laughs> yeah, I think I watched uh, like a 72 Animals Most Dangerous Birds or something on Netflix. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was one of them because they'd like grab the sloth out of the tree. And then sometimes they wouldn't be able to hold on to it. And so they'd like let it go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Some species of birds um, like osprey, they have difficulty with like releasing um, their, like opening their talons again. So some young osprey like uh, unfortunately die because sometimes they grab a fish that's too big or too heavy from them. And then they just kind of can't lift it and drown in the water. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Oh no. <laughs> so, what is the differences between like a hawk and an eagle from from your perspective? Yeah, so eagles are typically larger, um, and then hawks are typically a little bit smaller, and they go for um, other variety of prey. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because hawks are smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Like a little bit. They're like more aerodynamic. Yes, a little bit. Yes. Um, yeah, hawks are, yeah, they definitely go for like smaller songbirds uh, versus eagles or we're going to go for like a bit larger prey, for example, like, sa like, you know, bald eagles will grab salmon and then Cooper's hawk will grab like a chickadee or something like that. Oh, mm -hmm. this is really sad. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so eagles also seem to like, like we just went to the, uh, the Great Blue Heron Reserve a while back and there were a ton of eagles, like young ones, middle-aged ones and like fully white-headed mm -hmm. eagles are they more communal than hawks because you i never see hawks like all hanging out together yeah for sure um the bald eagles do tend to hang out in groups and the hawks they typically only hang around in groups when they're you know a mated pair or they it's like a, a family itself um but yeah bald eagles are are interesting because uh, they don't get like their full white head until they're about seven years old. And if you're a bald eagle with like, you know, a full white head, you typically have rights over uh, the bed's like fishing spot or perching spot. So you'll see them like kind of chase like the younger eagles away. And, you know, if they find an eagle, like uh, a younger eagle on a good perch, they'll just fly into it and just like push him away and like, this is my spot now. Oh my gosh. That <laughs> sort of reminds me of when uh, Sonny McKelsey was describing like indigenous places to fish that we have like our spot. 
it just it lines up and it's just kind of beautiful the the symmetry between nature and mm -hmm. and indigenous people and like mm -hmm. what they worked towards that's great yeah so moving from raptors to which was the next genre um like songbirds uh for example um so why do they sing that's a great question they sing because they're claiming territory and they're trying to attract their mates um and you know they all have very specific songs to their species and yeah it's just a great time especially during spring you know you hear all these uh different songs and it's a great way actually to learn your bird id because you can tell what kind of bird it is just from like the song or the call that it makes wow i've mm -hmm. heard i watched a, a nature documentary where they were saying that the like the song they sing is actually passed on from family to family mm -hmm. that like and the, they'll they'll modify it to make it their own but it's often like a family song like their parent teaches them this is our song mm -hmm. they learn it and then they sort of semi adapt it to their their own style yeah it's yeah some species are definitely you know they they learn um they don't know their their songs innately and it has to be taught from like their parents or they have to hear their parents like sing the song that's mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. you think I of see. like the recipes that you want to be passed on and the things you want to learn from your family uh, like some generations seem less interested in learning about their family lineage and then the next generation seems to be really interested in it i think there's like there, and I'm not the expert on this, but I think like when families move here, it's like the first generation typically wants their children to like sort of like embrace the new culture. And then their children seem to be really interested in like what their origins are beyond this culture. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there's like that connection. And I think that I don't have like a lot of family recipes or like traditions that we do. We've done every year for 50 years and we've always done this thing. And I think that having those things passed on, like nature can teach us things about like how to connect more deeply, how mm -hmm. to have things. Cause like we like traditions, we like things that we do each year. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you forget the why, like, the thing I don't like is um, New Year's resolutions because for so many people, it's like, it's silly things. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to like go on my phone less. And it's like, sure. But the point of it is for like you to think about how you could be a better person next year, how you could be a better spouse, a better family member, um, how you can like make a better difference in your community, like bigger things than like, I'm going to exercise more. Yeah. Like that's something you could think about all year. Like there's no requirement that you only think about that once. It's like, let's think bigger and like, let's think more impactful. And so the idea that you pass these things on in songbirds is just, it's a reminder of us to hopefully do the same. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, always constantly learning from nature, right? Um, even when I photograph uh, things or go birding and just observing and seeing what they do and, there's definitely like a lot of parallels that I, I start to make um, <laughs> to my personal life as well. Mm -hmm. That's good. So like for crows in comparison to songbirds, mm -hmm. we don't like the sound of crows that much. So is that something, is there a reason that we find their songs appealing? Because there could be a world where we hear songbirds and it is like children screaming or it's like it could be something worse it's not though it's appealing to our ears and when you hear like chickadees or something it's like it's a nice little melody and then you're like oh that's cool mm -hmm. so like do you is there any logic as to why songbirds seem to appeal to us as people uh it's a great question and i'm not entirely sure of a good answer for that um I think it's just, I don't know, for some reason it just sounds so good to us. It's like a little bit of like a sweeter tune, right? Versus like a call, <laughs> like a crow. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, maybe it's like we adapted for them because we used to, like now it seems like such a weird question, mm -hmm. but like we used to live with them. We used to live in the forest mm -hmm. around them. But it's interesting because like, and there's an indigenous story that the crow like lost its, the beauty in its voice, oh. that it was like taken away from it. Um, cause I, do ravens have good voices? Um, they are able to imitate a lot of like different uh, vocalizations. Um, but yeah, they typically sound similar to crows as well. Yeah. Okay, because I I do believe that it's the crow that like lost its it had its voice taken away. It was it was causing in the story it was causing like shenanigans, and then the the creator took away its ability to like sing beautiful songs, and so that's why so many people hate crows. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I'm just interested to try and understand 
what would have appealed. Because when you're out in nature, it's like none of those sounds are annoying. Like the sound of the river, like you're not like, turn that off. Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to sleep. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's also soothing. And I really am starting to believe more and more we're just not built for where we are now. Like a silent room where you can have no noise. Like we're just not designed for the, um, I listened to Brett and Heather Weinstein who are huge into evolutionary biology. I have their book right behind me, nice. A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, mm-hmm. where they talk about like the tools that nature teaches us, but also the pitfalls. Cause like you could kind of view the world as like one or the other. We should just do exactly what nature does or we should not. And then you think of like, some uh the bonobos are like nefariously like non-committal so like don't copy that (laughs) and so like there's things we can learn from them but then there's things to go like okay but no and we're humans so we can make our own decisions and so that book is what it's good for but i just i feel like we need to be more connected with nature because it is appealing to us it you can imitate whale songs and stuff but like the point is you're supposed to be out there Mm -hmm. yeah for sure and yeah, again, there's just so many things to learn from nature, right? And there's so many things to take away from it. Um, yeah. So why are they so small? Why are the the bird, the singing bird family usually so teeny tiny? Yeah, so evolutionary, they're just kind of um, built to be that way because they feed m- mainly on insects and you can't really have uh, a large body that just feeds mainly on like small insects and you can't really sustain it. Um but yeah, songbirds are, are the most diverse group of birds um, that we have. Uh, and it's interesting, there's actually a, a particular group of birds, uh, which are technically in this in like the songbird family called shrikes, uh, but they behave like raptors. And so um, they have a hooked bill as well, and they prey on other smaller birds about like the same size as they are. Um, but the problem is that their legs are not as strong and like as robust as raptors. Uh, they're not adapted for that. And so the way, the way that they pin their prey is by taking the prey and then impaling it on like a thorny branch or a bush or like barbed wire. <laughs> um, and because of this, they, uh, it got the name as uh, the butcher bird. And so you can like walk into a scene or like a thorny bush and you see like little insects and birds and like lizards like impaled on there and you know that it's, you know, the work of a shrike. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is such a funny name <laughs> for something that does that. Because what was mm-hmm. that? Um, um, Up was the movie. I forget what the, the beast was called in that movie, but like it's, yeah, it was like a shrike or something. So mm-hmm. that's funny that it's called mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and like they impale others like they impale all their yeah their prey um yeah because th- their legs aren't strong enough to like hold on to the prey and while well, they tear it apart right so they just use whatever is in the environment what is it like to learn this like what is it like to just be living your life and then learn these facts and just be like what it's so cool and i think that's just the um that's part of the appeal that makes me you know still be you know constantly wanting to be in nature and doing something for nature is because you know cool things like this like pop up every now and then and there's like some there's always some ad at odd animal that's doing like something different from like what it's supposed to be (laughs) it's also interesting because it's like we want our nature to be like pg like we want it to be like Mm -hmm. they're all just flying around at peace with each other and then when you start hearing like oh they like impale things and like like raptors eat other birds it's like whoa 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 i I had a deal i was gonna learn about biology here today but i did not agree to find out that like it's far more complex and things are far more aggressive was that a struggle for you at all or are you like was it easier to kind of come to terms with this is an ecosystem it's complicated yeah um yeah definitely i kind of just kind of accepted it as like okay this is just how life works right like evolution cares about survival not ethics and so um, the adaptations that came about today is just because for the survival of like a particular species. Right. Mm-hmm. For birds' eyes, like we hear about how crazy like hawks can see when they're way up in the high. Like, are all birds like that? Like when I think of like those uh, like chickadees and stuff, they're able to like maneuver through like thorns and bushes and stuff and like do aerodynamic things to get through things. Is this like all birds have pretty good eyesight? 
Uh, I would like to say yes, but I know there's going to be some exception out there for sure <laughs> that I don't know about. Um, but yeah, typically birds have have pretty good eyesight. Like that's something that they rely on pretty heavily. Um, it's not like insects, for example, which rely more on their antennae and like pheromones and sensing chemicals in in the environment. Right, and mm-hmm. I keep hearing birds' bones are hollow. Is this is this the case? Is this predominantly the case? Yes, least? that is correct. Um, it's because like their their bodies are all evolved to um, for flight, right? To sustain flight, and so having hollow bones just means you'll be lighter, and you'll be able to fly farther. And lots of birds, actually, um, if you start observing them, uh, they for raptors, for example, they typically like poop uh, while they perch before they fly away because you know less weight to carry. <laughs> Right, but mm-hmm. crows like to, and seagulls seem to go to the bathroom mid-flight. Mm-hmm. So is there like differences in the... Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. Because <laughs> that's the big fear is people like see a bunch of birds flying over away and they're like checking their shoulders to... Yeah, for sure. Yeah. In comparison to perhaps eagles, which sounds like they do it perched. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's definitely some nuances between like the species and like when they decide to go... <laughs> Interesting. And so what's the next genre? Um, we could talk about shorebirds, um, okay. which are really cool. Uh, we have a lot of shorebirds that migrate uh, in the Fraser Estuary because it is, um, again, we have really mild winters. And so, um, you know, the mudflats are still open and exposed and the beaches are still uh, not frozen. And so they can continue like uh, foraging along there. Uh they typically have the longer legs to kind of keep them away from the water. And they like to, well, the smaller shorebirds at least, like to fly around in flocks for safety. Is this, can you give us an example? Is this like a seagull? Um, so shorebirds would be something like dunlin um, or sanderlings. So a seagull would be more of like, uh, it's closer to like a seabird than a shorebird. So shorebirds are like little round um, birds with like long bills and like longer, longer legs. Mm-hmm. Interesting. P- please continue about yeah. the, sh- the short birds. No, um, I was just going to say with, um, with Dunlin, which we have, uh, hundreds of thousands that, you know, o- over winter on our coast, um, they have very interesting flight maneuvers. They're called murmurations where, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen those films where they, it looks like they're flying and they're kind of like making like different formations. It looks like a school of fish that are like swimming around together. Um, and Dunlin do this to kind of uh, avoid predators because lots of raptors like peregrine falcons like to hunt Dunlin. And That's so, what fish do it for too as well, right? Yes, exactly. And so, they, you know, it's beautiful to watch like these Dunlin murmurations because they're, you know, just flying over like mud flats and beaches and you see like a falcon <laughs> following them around. Um, that's a really cool adaptation to like observe and uh, yeah, to document. Yeah, we were watching um, Canada geese um, do murmuration is that what it's called yes i don't know if it was murmuration but they were Mm -hmm. practicing flying and they were just doing it locally in the same spot Mm -hmm. and they were taking Mm -hmm. off doing like a huge flight in a circle going one direction one direction then landing Mm -hmm. then taking off again and doing the same and it was like it's like over 150 birds all doing it together and it was just Mm so i think i have a recording of it because it was so wild to like that like they were having like a meeting in that like some birds were like I don't know how to do it, like a honk. And like, they Mm -hmm. were like talking to each other and it's like, they were all agreeing, like, we're going to take off now. And it was like, they're like having a meeting over here. And like, they don't care what, like I'm watching them do this. Mm -hmm. And it was just so, it's so humbling to think that like, they're communicating with each other. And there's a part of us that doesn't want that to be true. That like, wants that they're birds, they don't talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah, again, you know, as people, sometimes we like to think of very highly of ourselves and not consider other intelligence uh, of other organisms in like in their own way, shape or form, right? Um, And so, yeah, it's always very interesting to observe and watch these behaviors. Yeah, so, so far, I think we have two artistic things. We've got Mm -hmm. murmurations, which is a really fun word to say. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also have singing songbirds Mm -hmm. that sing. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the the next genre of birds? Um... There are lots of other ones. I... Sorry, they're like the next genre, the next, you said uh, sh- not shorebirds. Mm-hmm. Like what? seabirds. Yeah. Yeah, seabirds are a very special group of birds. They um, 
it's a group that I wish I had more time to kind of observe and watch. But because of the nature that they're typically very far away from the shore, we don't really see much of them. So this includes, you know, uh, albatrosses, for example, um, which are really long. Um, yeah, their life history is basically based on just the ocean. And uh, it's a really unique group of birds because they rely heavily on the ocean. And it's a great way to kind of um, have them as ecosystem indicators, because if they start declining, that means there's something wrong with like um, the prey that they're feeding on or like the environment that they're living in. Um, a lot of seabirds nest in really remote islands. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of remote islands are threatened by um, introduced uh, animals like rats or snakes that typically weren't there. Um, but, you know, humans intentionally or in unintentionally bring them to the islands and that causes a lot of like uh, seabird decline, um, also bycatch from fisheries, albatrosses in particular. They're uh, they're attracted to like long line fisheries where there you know there's a bait on a hook, and once they um, you know chomp down on the fish, they're not able to like let go, and you know unfortunately they drown because of that. Um, so seabirds are very vulnerable group of birds, and it's unfortunate that we don't you know have more of a connection to them because we are land base for the most part yeah that is another thing that somebody commented on um i forget who it was but they just made the point of like birds are really good at adapting so much so that you don't even realize that you're not supposed to have seagulls in the middle of a city mm -hmm. like that is how good seagulls are at adapting is that like you're just like oh or what are the other one pigeons that they've adapted so much that they're just like you like I've never even been to New York, but New York and pigeon synonymous with yep. each other. They're mm -hmm. just like, you tie them together, mm -hmm. even though that's not how it was. That's not how it's been. Mm -hmm. They adapted and we go, cool, great. Birds are adapting. But then there are others that are having trouble adapting or that don't, haven't needed to adapt to us yet. And it sounds like the albatross is one of them. They've managed to be out in the ocean. We don't interact with it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, but now we're starting to have like, um, the garbage patches in the ocean, which are like, uh, I think one, I think the Pacific garbage patch is like the size of Texas or something mm -hmm. like that, which is crazy big. It's insane, yeah. And so this is starting to have effects because this is where they've been, they've been peacefully floating on the water. And then we've got so much garbage in those patches that it's like incomprehensible. And uh, there's that person, Boy on Slot, who is uh, really interested in cleaning up the, the ocean. And he's got these machines that are going to go over and they're not going to go so deep as to pick up fish, but they're going to try and catch that, that surface level stuff. Mm -hmm. But what he realized... Um, was that he needs to focus more on the communities that don't have proper like um, sewage and plumbing and garbage disposal and they have rivers and they all just throw their garbage and stuff. And like these are um, not developed in the way that we're used to with our uh, garbage delivery pickup and stuff. And so they they bathe in the water, but they also put their garbage in there and then that garbage leaks into the... And that's what causes a lot of the, the garbage patches is mm -hmm. these... So he realized putting something up there that will pick up the garbage from the river before it gets into the ocean will be one of the longer, more sustainable solutions. Uh, he's still going to work on the ocean, from my understanding, mm -hmm. but the the problem is to like get it where it's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. For sure, and yeah, it's important to be careful about a lot of these like cleanup efforts um, that say we're just going to sift everything out of the water, right? Because there's a lot of microorganisms that um, live on the surface of the water. And uh, they contribute like really uh, greatly to like the ecosystem in the ocean. And so, you know, just going out with like a big scoop in the ocean, uh, you're going to take out a lot of things as well, not just the garbage. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that's so true. And we have to be careful anytime that we're trying to do something good, because there's always like a risk that we're going to do something like there's no zero consequences. Mm -hmm. We'll do something and it'll have no effect at all on anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, you know, nature is so complex that... Uh, uh, you can't just go in there with like uh, a big hammer and try to solve the, the issue that way. You have to like very carefully look at the situation and talk to researchers who are actually studying these uh, ecosystems and see like what is actually viable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do like herons fit into this? Because I look at a heron mm -hmm. and I go, 
that's a pterodactyl. <laughs> that's very clearly like a modern day pterodactyl. I would agree. Um, <laughs> herons would fit in like more of like the wading birds uh, category. What is a wading bird? So wading birds are. Um, birds that kind of wait, wait around the water and they catch fish and like salamanders or uh, other amphibians or frogs uh, to feed on. So typically you'll see wading birds around like marshes or wetlands. So what do heron eat? Did you just say they eat frogs? Yes. Uh, so her the great blue herons are actually very interesting. They eat uh, fish, amphibians, and I've seen them like cat eat earthworms and voles as well, which are kind of rodent. Voles? Yes. So you... V-O-L. V-O-L-E-S. Voles. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. And those are here in BC? Yes. So voles. Voles, yes. You will see them, um, and like rodents, I've seen like herons like, you know, hang around farmers' fields and you see them like snatch a rodent or a vole out from like a ditch or something. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> they eat those too. <laughs> are they like more community oriented? Because we have like the Great Blue Heron Reserve, mm -hmm. but is it like, but I also see them just chilling by themselves, super still. Yeah. They're, so typically they are more solitary, uh, but there comes a time, uh, during springtime where they do um, kind of become more social and gregarious because they're finding mates and they're building nests and, you know, they have rookeries and things like that, which is like um, a heron, kind of nesting site. Rookery? Yeah. How do you, rookery? It's like a R-O-O-K-E-R-Y, rookery, yeah. There's so many words I don't know, <laughs> rookery, okay. Yes. Do, this is a, just a weird, curious question. Mm -hmm. Do eagles hawk, like do raptors mess with herons? Do they not talk to each other? They're distant? Um, uh, typically, if a heron is like a, a smaller chick, then a raptor is more tempted to, to take it. But if, you know, it's a full-size adult, it's just way too dangerous. Like herons are like a beak, like super large, and you know, nobody wants to mess with that. Interesting. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So what what are some of your favorite birds that stand out to you that you're just like, this is this is craziness? Yeah. Um, recently, it's been the albatrosses, uh, specifically, you know, for their life history and the fact that um, they just live completely different lives from us. Like, can't imagine living out at sea for three years. So would you, would you like, if I, like, had, like, a, a golden card mm -hmm. and you could go study them, would that be something, like, you'd oh, jump yeah. at? 100%. Um, just photographing and documenting them would be would be amazing as well. Um, yeah, albatrosses. I haven't seen one ever, so that's like my next, <laughs> next on my list. Um, but locally, um, my favorite birds have to be like the American Dipper. What is that? It is a small songbird about like the size of your fist. And typically you'll see them like bopping up and down stones on a creek. And it's a little weird because, you know, they're a songbird, but they're not like on a tree or a bush or something. And you might not think much of them because they have really drab colors. They have like a, a dark grayish head and like a, a navy, dark navy blue body. Um, but what makes this bird so interesting is that they l literally dive into fast flowing creeks and rivers and they will catch um, insects or salmon eggs under the water. So like things like caddis flies or stone flies, they'll fish right out from like the bottom of the creek and then you see them pop right back out onto a stone and then... Sorry, cactus flies? Uh, caddis flies. What are these? These are um, aquatic insects that... Um, they kind of look like uh, mealworms, but if you had the back, the lower half of the mealworm, like um, I don't know what a mealworm is. Oh, a mealworm. Um, it's like those um, like long, um, like beetle larvae that look like um the stuff that you see at the pet store. You know, oh, okay, they feed okay. it like um other things. Um, but yeah, they look like that, except like the lower half of their body is covered in like stones or sticks or whatever stuff that they find uh, in the water. That's kind of like their shell. They make their own shell, essentially, um, because they live most of their lives uh, in creeks and waters. I didn't know that. Am I supposed to know that <laughs> there are bugs that live in the water? Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? <laughs> They're perfectly adapted to the water. And the way that they create those like little casings is through, uh, they produce like 
uh, like a silk or a super glue, essentially, that is waterproof, um, which is how, you know, all the little stones stick um, to to their bodies. And then they use that to, as their shell, as like their protection. Yeah, this just reminds me of learning <laughs> that, uh, that our nose is a dehumidifier. And so you're supposed to breathe through your nose mm-hmm. because it dehumidifies the air. Mm-hmm. And it was like... I, like my body didn't come with a like a user's manual. Like these little bugs know what to do, and it's like I didn't know that my nose was capable of this. And like there mm-hmm. are a lot of people who don't breathe through their nose and have mm-hmm. huge deleterious effects in their life because they don't get good sleeps. Mm-hmm. Because you actually get more oxygen if you breathe through your nose than if you breathe through your mouth. Yep. It's like twenty percent more. Mm-hmm. And for athletes, it's actually one of the biggest improvements if they want to improve their their whatever they're competing at is to breathe through their nose. And focus on cool. more. Yeah. yeah. And oh. so, like, when you realize it, it's just, yeah. <laughs> my mind is being blown today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see no mosquitoes, but I have a Don't sneaking suspicion, mm-hmm. but that they seem to probably contribute something. They contribute a lot. Uh, <laughs> 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 Unfortunately. Um, so, the mosquitoes that kind of bother us are. Uh, only a handful of species that actually, you know, um, need blood uh, to... Can we get rid of those? Yes. Okay. And no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a huge benefit, right, to getting rid of mosquitoes. And they're doing it uh, most of these days through genetic control. And so they capture males, male mosquitoes, also the only mosquitoes that bite you are, are females because they're the ones who need um, the protein in your blood to uh, create their eggs and lay their eggs. And so that's why they, they need to bite people and you know, they need blood. Um, but the males, completely harmless. They just uh, feed on nectar and pollinate flowers and things like that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> they do good. They do good. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the way they're like managing mosquitoes around uh, developing countries, especially, you know, if you have dengue or malaria, which is very dangerous, right? Um, so what they're doing is they're taking male mosquitoes, they're altering their genes to make them sterile, and then they're releasing those male mosquitoes out into um, a specific area. And when those male mosquitoes mate with the female, she produces eggs that are sterile. So uh, the population like ends there and it significantly drops the... Um, uh, the mosquito population, which is a much better alternative than, you know, walking around and spraying everywhere uh, pesticides, right? That's what we do now, right? Like mm-hmm. we go, like we, uh, and the, th- there's something to do with like the river rising and lowering so much that seems to like cause like a spurt in summer mm-hmm. that causes them to be like worse or something like that. Yeah. But right now I think we just spray everything to try and like bring down the, am I, is mm-hmm. that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A, a lot of, yeah, still pesticide use. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see where research is taking us, right? Like it's a lot more um, uh, safer for people. And so it's a lot more effective as well if you're stopping generations of like mosquito <laughs> from coming out. Yeah, yeah, because we don't have malaria here, right? With our mosquitoes, like mm-hmm. our mosquitoes are pretty, they're annoying, but mm-hmm. they're not harmful. Yeah, they don't carry um, uh, the malaria uh, virus, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so what other birds interest you? Um there is a relative to the great blue heron. It's called the American bittern. And that bird is super interesting. Be- bittern? Yes. B-I-T-T-E-R-N? And yes, bittern. Okay. American bittern. Um, it's super cryptic. It likes to hide around marshes and uh, wetlands. And I found one at my local marsh last year after searching for about 24 hours for it. <laughs> Like 24 hours? Not straight. Okay. Um, but like in total, 24 hours of searching and waiting around the marsh uh, for this bittern. They, I think the real special thing that comes from them is their song. It sounds like a dripping faucet. And I can play that for you if you'd like. <laughs> we have to play that. What? <laughs> yes. It plays a, a sound that sounds like a dripping A dripping water faucet. faucet. That's yes. so interesting. You wouldn't think that this noise comes from a bird, but it does. And I... It, 
Yeah, it blew my mind when I heard it. I am just going to get used to having my mind blown. I'm just going <laughs> to try and l- lean into it. Cause... I just love that so much. <laughs> yeah. I so, just, like, my, mm-hmm. as I told you, my grandmother was really interested in birds, and yeah. she really enjoyed birding, and um, I miss her a lot, and I want to take her interest seriously. And uh, she believed she was a practicing Catholic, so mm-hmm. I want to recognize her religion and understand it better. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was also, she'd go on, like, she'd travel the world to go see birds. Uh, so it's a pleasure to sit down. Please go ahead yeah, and, for sure. and play the sound. No, she sounds wonderful. Um, but I will play the song for you. What are those background birds? Um, a lot of like... Uh... Um, yeah, so that is the song of the American bitter. <laughs> oh my gosh, it almost sounds like uh, like pulling a, a bow and arrow back mm-hmm. or something and releasing it. Like it's got like a... That's really... That's really interesting. Do, you, do yeah. we know why? Um... It's a low frequency call, so it travels over like the marsh for longer distance versus like a high pitch one. Um, but yeah, hearing that like last year over my local marsh, they typically saw, sing during like dusk and dawn. So just watching like the sunset and hearing that, it's just so beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh! So they're like trying to communicate with something far away. Yeah. So typically, they're uh, they sing to declare their territory and to attract mates as well, and saying like, "Hey, I'm here," and you know, in this marsh. If, Okay. Viable mates. So, so like we like I don't know if everybody knows this, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. FM radio is more it's it's more like that so that people can have higher quality sound, mm-hmm. but it can't travel <clears throat> as far of distances. Yes. Whereas with AM, it's more A like the, the bittern, yeah. which is like lower. So you mm-hmm. can you can have like talk shows, but you can't have music playing mm-hmm. because the waveform is such that that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. That's what you're saying. The bittern knows how to travel, like s- do things long distance. Yeah. And it doesn't have short, where like a chickadee is doing like... Yeah, like sharp sharp calls, right? Um, yeah, but because they're so solitary most of the time, um, they have to find each other somehow. <laughs> and so they use that song to communicate and uh, yeah, attract other, other birds, other bitterns. <laughs> what? Like it's just, it's so crazy that like these birds know things that I think are interesting about like AM FM radio. Like mm. they know, like they're living yeah, as they a thing. figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> and I figured it out. But so it's just, it's very humbling to realize that right. there's, there's parallels. There's, there's different ways of utilizing these tools. And I think that like what we can also take away from like the life of like a bittern versus like a chickadee is like sometimes you need to take time and reflect, figure out where you're at, calm down, Mm -hmm. and make sure that you're happy in your life, figure out how you're going to move forward, and, like, just just breathe and just meditate. And it sounds like that might be something you get out of being out with with, uh, wildlife and, like, watching is, like, you're reminded that you're just just one part of this Mm -hmm. great complex world. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what makes wildlife photography and nature photography to me like so uh, rewarding and humbling is that um, for the dipper, for example, it's such a small bird, but it's so brave. It's like diving right into the water, (laughs) doing its thing, right? Um, And learning things about the bitter and and how uh, they've adapted to, you know, this sort of environment. Um, It's very humbling to learn more and more about uh, the birds and the wildlife and seeing them observing them in their natural habitat and realizing that um yeah i'm just a small part uh in this world and it's a huge privilege to me personally to be able to like 
watch and document this um, these scenarios and beautiful scenes because you know as a as a child I I never did and suddenly you know I'm listening to like bittern sing as the sun sets like it's it's magical to me. Yeah, would mm-hmm. you say that this is like because we have all these different forms like people go to yoga, mm-hmm. people are trying to meditate in all these different ways. Would you say that there's like a meditative effect of what you're doing when you're so focused on something other than yourself? Like you're focused on finding a bird. Like you mm-hmm. said you worked for 24 hours mm-hmm. to find that bird. Can you like what was that process like? Because we're used to instant gratification. That's what we're accustomed to is if I want to hear a bitter and I type it into YouTube, I get it instantly. Mm-hmm. But there's like you're missing something of that experience. You committed time to finding that. Can you just tell us about that journey of finding that one bird? Yeah. Um, yeah, the American bitter and really schooled me <laughs> like the process of um, uh, nature and wildlife photography um, because what makes it so difficult is that you have no – little to no control over your subject and the scene. And so to create an image that you have in your head or an image that you think will will, will be impactful, uh, a lot of things have to line up and come together, right? Um, yeah, and that bittern just taught me, you know, patient, the, the importance of like being patient and pers- being persistent and being respectful and um, just doing your research and learning more about your birds and the habitat and the environment before you can actually find this thing. Um, but yeah, even though it's most of the time I come away with nothing when I try to find a specific species, a specific, specific bird or look for a specific image, uh, I don't typically achieve it. But when the stars do align, oh my gosh, it's so perfect. <laughs> so how did that 24 hours play out for you? Was that like over three days, weeks? What was the process to, to find yeah, this bird? I think that was over two or three weeks and it involved like walking around my marsh and uh, scanning like all the cattails and the reeds very carefully every single time. And then, uh, there's different marshes around this location. And so I would like spend one night, uh, one evening at a particular marsh and then I don't hear anything. And so I have to like try another spot another time. And, um, yeah, sometimes you just decide not to sing and <laughs> you just have to come back and try again. Yeah. So you saw it, but you it didn't sing. Or like that's something that arises, I guess. Um, actually, that that's something that could arise. But the way that I found it was that it actually started singing. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's a bitter. <laughs> and so I just followed the sound. And um, eventually I found him like hiding among the reeds. And he was in a position where it was like perfect for like a backlit uh, photo. And so I just took that to my advantage and positioned myself where... Um, you know, it was just glowing behind him, like the marsh and, and the light. It was beautiful. That's that's mm-hmm. crazy to think about how much, like, things are not... Because first, you have to find the bird, mm-hmm. which sounds like it's a task. Good luck, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you have to get, like, an angle on the bird. Then you need the light mm-hmm. to be effective to take photo of such bird. That is all, like... Balancing on a tightrope, it sounds like. It, it is. Um, and yeah, but you know, the beautiful thing about it is that the birds are wild and they can do whatever they want. They can carry out with their lives. And I'm just there to kind of document like that li- little sliver in their life, you know. Um, and it's very humbling. It, it's really a big privilege to me to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, it takes a lot of like <laughs> persistence and patience and actually really knowing and loving your subject to to be able to get to that point. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Do you listen to music? Do you like do anything else or do you just like let the environment imp- like how do you approach usually like going out on a day to take photos? Yeah, um, I typically research into like a particular species that I want to photograph and then I look into the potential locations and habitats they could be in. And then when I'm visiting those locations, I'm also birding and like seeing what else is around, like looking at um, maybe there's like mammal tracks and signs that are around. And typically I'm not really listening to music because you have to be attentive to uh, your environment and uh, you have to know like who's calling or singing and be able to pick out like, oh, that's just a chickadee, you know, Um, or that's a bald eagle over there. Um, And so you can kind of focus your energy towards uh, a specific species. And... Yeah, the whole process, I would say, is like 90% of the work. And then the last 10% is when you find something and you're like, okay, this is worth it. That's when like the camera comes out and actually uh, the photo and the video take happens. 
So that seems like you have to learn like a lot to do this. Like, so for people who are like, oh, I, I could do like, cause I look at some nature photos and I, I could do that. Like, mm -hmm. and I think we all have like a little bit of a bias towards like, I'm just great. And I could do lots of different things, but like to be able to take the patients to research what bird you're looking for, mm -hmm. to figure out where its habitats are going to be located, where those habitats are not only like globally but like within your own within the Fraser Valley or mm -hmm. within BC and then to go out bring all your equipment your gear uh, like I've seen that you've had to like put on like like <laughs> wet wetsuit kind of equipment yeah. to be ready to be uh, out in the water to get that good angle mm -hmm. um, I'm sure for listeners I'm sure in an ethical way mm -hmm. um, but then you have to also be good at photography which is like like some people just focus on the, like photography is like hard yeah. just if you're just doing photography. Yeah. So what is that journey kind of been like? Um, so yeah, it's uh, the best way and to do it, I think is just to do it ethically um, because you're putting your subjects like f front and foremost, right? Like their welfare is, uh, is really important if you really truly love your subjects. And unfortunately there are, you know, photos of like people baiting their subject or just using callback, just, you know, playing the song, for example, like an alarm call that attracts like particular species of birds. Um, so you're against that. So like, I, it's not a black or white issue. I would say, um, if you're doing it a lot in like a popular park, then that is really detrimental to the bird. But if, for example, you're, uh, in a remote area and, no one's ever going to see this bird again. And then you use it like once or twice. And it, that's the only time it'll hear in its life. Then the, the disturbance to that particular individual is very minimal. Um, but I personally don't do that. Um, there's such a thing as, you know, the right subject and like the wrong location. And so when that happens to me, I'm just like, oh, I have to find another one somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's like a black or white issue, but um, it's important to note that, um, you know, overusing it or using like baiting methods is in like popular areas is really, really bad. <laughs> and like just taking advantage of like a particular, um, uh, species, uh, for example. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Again, things I would have never like considered mm -hmm. is like, how would you approach those types of techniques and tools and like the, the responsibilities you have, because you talk about your, your subjects with such care mm -hmm. in comparison to <clears throat> the average person who sees a bird and goes, click. Mm -hmm. What about flash? Is flash an issue? Um, I personally don't use flash. Um, it could be an issue for like nocturnal subjects, like owls. Um, some individuals are more sensitive to it than others. Um, uh, so it's, again, it's like a case to case basis, um, for, but for owls, for example, I do not photograph them during the day because they're sleeping and I don't really want to disturb them from that. Uh, it's like every time an owl opens its eyes and looks at you, you're taking away from it's like resting time and it needs as much energy as it does to like hunt in the evening. So the way I photograph owls is that I come around during dawn or dusk when they're actually active and they're actually moving. Um, and yeah, typically when owls sleep during the day, they're hidden in like really thick, uh, branchy or thorny bushes. And it's not a good photo anyway. And you're like, I think it is, this is not, um, a good photo to make out of it. If it's just sleeping in like a thorny bush <laughs> and I don't want to disturb it, you know? Um, so typically I will find an owl and then I'll just come back during like dawn and dusk and when it's actually active. And then I set up a shot that way. And it's a real challenge because the light is dwindling, um, to, so you have to be really good at like your camera settings and um, know what you're doing to able to to be able to capture like a sharp image. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm interested to know what process like if are there I'm sure there are books out there that explain this. I'm sure there are, but I kind of figured it out on my own. <laughs> Okay. So like, do you, do you think that that would be, you're very insightful on this. And, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know who Stephen who is, uh, but I had the opportunity to interview him mm -hmm. and he wrote 105 hikes, uh, in and around Southwestern BC. Uh, he also wrote, um, best hikes and nature walks for children and families, nice. um, that, which is coming out May, 2022, uh, which is next month. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he wrote another hike, a hiking book, um, best hikes um, in and around southwestern BC. Um, 
And so he's written quite a few books just to draw on the Lower Mainland and hiking. And you have a lot of insights on 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 birds, on how to how to watch birds ethically, how to go out in nature ethically. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just interested, like, what's what are some of the steps you would outline for somebody who's like they're hearing this, they're going like, I got to get out there right now. I'm putting on my shoes. What would you What would you want to say to that person? Um, I would say it's definitely. Uh, more important to learn more about your subjects and their habitats and kind of uh, learning when a bird is showing signs of stress. Uh, So for owls, for example, you know, um, when nocturnal species are sleeping during the day, they have their eyes closed. And when you're trying to take a photograph and you see it opening its eyes, it's telling you that you're too close and you have to like back off. Um, So, you know, knowing those little nuances, um, I think is more important than just, you know, just going for the photo. I know it's like really exciting to get a photo of like a really cute owl, but um, it's important to research your subject and to um, and to be respectful and ethical of them as well. That is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And being mindful. So like really, is there good books on this that you would recommend people look into to make sure that they're like, do they have those nuances that you're sort of highlighting about owls and Mm -hmm. about their distance? Um, There's definitely a couple articles. I'm not sure if there are a couple books, uh, but articles from uh, Birds Canada uh, ourselves and from like Audubon Society that highlight like how to photograph owls ethically or how to photograph, you know, particular birds ethically. Um, Yeah, there's definitely resources available online. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Would you, if some, this is just another Mm -hmm. hypothetical, if somebody (laughs) came to you and they were like, you should write a book on this. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like either start a podcast or write a book, whichever one you're more comfortable with. But I feel like this is a topic that's, when I reached out, it's like, it feels like we're in need of more people Mm -hmm. like yourself. Like, um, it's important that we care for these habitats. And even if part of the proceeds went to like restoring habitats or something, Mm -hmm. that this is something that is not on many people's radar, but that should be, and that would be cool to have like a good understanding of what to do in BC in regards to birds. Yeah, that's, uh, I never thought about that. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that's something I I could potentially do. Um, Yeah, you're right. And a lot of people talk about um, like photographing uh, wildlife quite ethically that way. Um, But yeah, if there's... You know, if there's a uh, if, if there's a need for it, definitely something to fill. It's just it's nice when people put their values first, mm-hmm. and like some like with people who post on Instagram, I'm sure that you've seen people post on Instagram, and you go, "What are you doing?" Mm-hmm. Like, no, and like yeah. having educational resources, I think, are so important for people because you're one of the best people to do it because you mm-hmm. care, and you don't just care about getting the photo; mm-hmm. you care about doing it right. And I think we need to work to elevate voices like yours who mm-hmm. who care about that part of it. And Stephen has done a great job in all of his books of highlighting, like, this is what this meant to Indigenous people. This is how to approach hiking. Uh, don't, like, um, what is that saying? Like, uh, pack in, pack out. Like, mm-hmm. don't leave stuff there. Those type of information, I think, is so important for people to be able to learn about. Yeah, for sure. And, um, no, that's great to hear that he's doing um, some fantastic work on that end. Um but yeah, I've definitely seen on Instagram like uh, a couple of like, some owl species that are, you know, very nocturnal and they don't open their eyes until it's it's completely dark and it's like bright daylight and their eyes are open. I'm like, mm, how close did you get to this owl? <laughs> like it's supposed to be sleeping right now. Um, but yeah, it's important to to keep them keep the welfare of our subjects um, uh, at the forefront. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you would be willing, you have an amazing um, nature photography page. I'm wondering if we would be able to take those photos. Uh, we can go through perhaps each one and you can kind of walk us through what the process was. And then um, we can cut to when you're describing it uh, for listeners, what I can edit in that photo so that people can see your photo and how you went about taking it in each one. Do, yeah, that for sure. Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. I think there's a couple, yeah, a couple owl species there so, uh, that might be good. Yeah, what are your favorite yeah. type of owls or what, what stands out to you about owls? Uh, owls are just, they're, they're so interesting because they live like completely different lifestyles compared to us. And, you know, we're typically, you know, trying to avoid the dark and we're not... Um, we're not adept to that sort of environment. And so seeing, you know, owls like wake up at dusk and dawn and, you know, they're about to, 
um, they're about to start their day and, you know, they have all these crazy adaptations, like they can hear, um, you know, mice and like small movements throughout the forest. It's just so, so interesting. Yeah, I mm-hmm. find owls, we got to see one in the daytime um, on a tree just yes. watching us. And it was so, it was the first time my partner had ever seen an owl. And it was such a unique experience. And we still, maybe you can help identify mm-hmm. it for us after. But we didn't know what it, what type of owl it was. And we were mind blown to see it during the day. Mm-hmm. And it was her first time. And so it was super humbling. And that's what sort of got me down the, I need to know more about birds. Like, yeah. how do I not know? And so it was, uh, I find owls probably one of the most interesting because their head turns all the way around i don't know do you know why that that <laughs> um yeah that's because um their eyes are so big they actually can't move the, like their eyeballs like we do so they're fused to like their sockets and so for an owl to look uh around it it has to like turn its whole head it can't move its eyeballs um, itself does it have better sight than yes uh they do have better sight than most people for sure because they uh they need to hunt in the dark yeah interesting so we have the American bittern. Is mm-hmm. this the one that you're talking about? Yes, this is the uh, the bittern that schooled me. <laughs> um, yeah. And so what was the, so this was the one that took 24 hours to take the photo of. Yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so where did where was that photo taken? Uh, that was around in Surrey. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Like a certain spot. Um, yeah, like the local wetlands around there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we have the barred owl, Mm -hmm. Strix varia. Yes. Yeah, that is, uh, that's a very interesting individual, actually. So (laughs) I found this guy in a very popular park in Surrey. Um, it's a small forest understory, and that's where he and his mate are roosting. We're roosting for the winter, and people were setting up, like, a photo shoot like booths and like setups like right under the forest and the owls just sitting there and like watching them during the day so are you okay with that is that what they did was well they they weren't really bothering the owls and the mm-hmm. owls chose to be there like um they're completely the owls are very com- uh they're comfortable with it. um barred owls are very good in urban environments interesting yeah and but yeah the people don't notice that the owl, you know there's two owls like looking at them there and i was like oh that's funny oh wow <laughs> um it's very cute yes it is um but yeah be, they they like that place because there, you know tons of squirrels running around and once it gets dark it doesn't matter how busy it is during the day it's all theirs what does it mean to you to be able to get a photo like this like this is such a such a special photo. Yeah, it is. Um, it's it's really rewarding because owls are typically roosting in like really unphotogenic sites, and so having one, finding one in like a good spot and like um, where it's comfortable is really, really, uh, yeah, rewarding. It, roosting. That just mm-hmm. it's a word I only think of with chickens. Yes. So <laughs> you're expanding my vocabulary. <laughs> Um, now we're talking about a marsh wren, mm-hmm. Cystothorus palustris. Yeah. I didn't say that right, did I? Uh, no, I think you got that. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah. this is a very, very small for, for people just listening. Yeah, this is a small bird that is quite loud. They uh, Birds in the wren family, they they belt out so many notes within a uh, you know, a couple of seconds. Um, and it's, once you get an ear for it, you can kind of tell if a bird is a wren because it's just like so many notes, like as it's, I can play the song for you. Okay, yes, <laughs> please play the sound for us. I can't, I can't replicate this. <laughs> for people just listening, this is sort of what I would call like a chickadee. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got, bird's feet are so interesting because they're like, they're orange Well, on this marsh wren. They're orange and they kind of remind you of like chicken feet and it's on a stick and it is teeny tiny. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's very interesting to see sort of the makeup of these birds and actually really think about it. Yeah, they're, they're great birds and yeah, they've got quite the voice. So I'll play that for you now. Yeah, so it's that sort of, um, yeah, lots of notes within like a couple seconds. And yeah, they're quite loud and quite territorial as well during this time. This is such a cool episode. I'm learning so much. (laughs) This is blowing my mind. Oh, that's great. Okay, so this isn't a bird, Mm -hmm. but it's a yellow-bellied marmot, which is Marmota Mm -hmm. flaviventris. Yeah, flaviventris, yeah. Yeah. 
It's very cute. It looks sort of like an otter for people just listening. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually a member of like the rodent uh, family. Right. Um, and when I first moved to the Okanagan, one of my targets was the uh, the yellow-bellied marmot. And I was like, oh, you know, there's not a ton of them around. It turns out they're everywhere. They're like <laughs> squirrels <laughs> just popping up left and right. Um, during the early spring, I would drive out to like this location because I knew there were like a couple of marmots hanging out. Um, and I would try and photograph them, but never come away with something like you know, photogenic. And then as I was driving on the way home, like beside the road of uh, our street, there was just a marmot there. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, okay, it's like a five minute walk from my place. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so interesting. So how long did you live in the Okanagan for? Uh, I stayed in the Okanagan for about eight months. What was that like? Did you, like, how did that compare to being in like wetlands? Um, very interesting. Um, a lot of the places uh, in the Okanagan aren't as well developed so there's a lot of like dirt roads and um, uh, yeah a lot more like grasslands and hills and things like that to to cover um, which can be unnerving at times because I was uh, still a newish photographer and you know just wandering into kilometers of like uh, hills and tall grass like oh I don't know what's like lurking around the corner <laughs> or around like those trees. <laughs> is that is that a challenge like is there differences in like the makeup of the animals depending on like desert versus wetlands like we hear about like the color of certain animals does mm -hmm. that change you said in the Philippines they were they were more colorful mm -hmm. do we know why that is? Yeah for sure um so there's definitely diff different species that you see in like specific habitats. Um, so for example, you won't find an albatross in the prairie, right? Like that's not their habitat. They live in the sea. Um, but yeah, uh, typically birds who are more colorful, uh, those are the males because they're uh, attracting females. And with species that are polygamous, meaning they have many different mates, um, the males will typically tend to be more vibrant and uh uh, exaggerated, I guess, with the colors because they're trying to attract many different mates versus um, birds that are monogamous, for example, like Canada geese, you know, males and females don't look very different from each other because they, they mate, um, uh, they only have one mate and then, you know, they raise their, their chicks. Um, but yeah, the result of males looking like really decorated and colorful is because of the sexual selection. So that's because the females are preferring males that look, you know, more and more brighter and ridiculous and like more colors and things like that. It's it's interesting that like the beauty that we see. So like, um, I already forgot it. What was that word to describe them flying in that beautiful? Uh, murmuration. Murmuration. Yes. That is caused to try and protect them from being attacked. It's not for mm -hmm. beauty. Nope. But we see it and <laughs> yeah. we go, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then with the, the sounds that they make to try and attract mates, that is for sexual selection. Mm -hmm. And then the color is for sexual selection. So it's just interesting that like the things that make birds beautiful to us aren't necessarily all just for sexual selection of the other mate mm -hmm. sometimes it's just uh for protection and mm -hmm. for safety and that we see beauty despite the fact that it wasn't meant for that mm -hmm. we see beauty in that yeah for sure yeah there's like lots of great memes on the internet you know with like birds singing they're actually you know saying profanities and things like that <laughs> it's not like a sweet song to <laughs> that we hear <laughs> That's yeah okay so now we're looking at the great horned owl for people just listening uh which is um, I'm going to mess this up. Bubo virginianus. virginianus. Yes, uh, Bubo virginianus. Um, no, you got it right. That's great. Um, this uh, is one of those scenarios where I was kind of looking for birds around a particular location. And suddenly, you know, I, f I find like an owl and I have to like run back <laughs> 20 minutes to my car, grab my camera and, um, and hopefully he was still there. And I believe this was a female, and I could tell that because females hoot seven times versus males that hoot like five or six uh, notes. And no way, like yeah. they have a different number of. Who Maybe. figures this out? How do you? Birders. <laughs> but like, how? Without going into their business, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that you're correct? Correct. Um. Like they hoot seven times or they yes. hoot six times and you're like, yeah. now I'm 100% sure that this is a male versus a female. But like, mm -hmm. 
You have to you have to go check. You yeah, and the people before have checked, and that's what we're going off of. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's some species of owl that sing like the the females sing a higher note of like a similar the same song, and then the males sing like a lower note. And so when owls like two owls sing together, it's called a duet. I didn't even know that they. I didn't mm-hmm. know that. <laughs> yeah. They sing. I didn't know that before. Yeah. They they sing together, like they make a song together. Yes. So, mm-hmm. are owls typically mono- monogamous? Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, typically, they do have one mate. Yeah, until the mate uh, dies, or yeah. I don't know why I take it personally. Like I'm like more proud of owls. Like good for you, owls. Like penguins. I'm like I get you guys. Yes. I just appreciate the the monogamous mm-hmm. move more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what was the journey of taking this photo? You said that it, you had to go back and get your camera, but were you mm-hmm. out looking and you saw it or? Yeah, I was I was out looking. Uh, it was my first time around this park. And yeah, I was just looking to see what's there. And then I saw the owl and ran back, grabbed my camera. And uh, she was quite active uh, on this branch there. And I just took that uh, to my advantage and, you know, photographed her that way. Because typically, as I mentioned, they would be like like a very obscured location, not very photogenic. Um, but when I saw her singing there, I was like, oh, you know, this is my chance. You know, this doesn't happen often. And that was actually one of the, the more challenging photographs to capture because um, I shot it with a very slow shutter speed. Um, so that means, uh, because I need to gather more light for the scene, this was at dusk, you have to open the shutter of the camera uh, a lot longer. The problem with that is that if the owl moves, it's going to become a blurry image. So you have to take lots of frames and kind of strategically wait for like the owl to pause and then you take your photo. Right. Um, so that it looks sharp and like bright like that. Okay, you have like a mm-hmm. crazy camera. Can you tell us a little bit about like, so like people who bird watch, they have this crazy tube over their camera. <laughs> What? Please explain this to me. Yes. Um, so, yeah, wildlife photographers have a what you call a long lens or a telephoto lens, um, and they, we use that to like magnify the image uh, uh, seen on the camera. And so that means we don't have to get as close to our subject. Um, and I think that's good for like our safety. And there's like you definitely don't want to walk up to an owl and take its photo because you're disturbing it or, you know, it's going to fly away and it's going to get scared. And so, yeah, long lenses really help in trying to, like, uh, bring the animal closer to you. Can you tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about your camera and your setup for people who might be like, this is really, like, I'm excited about the idea of doing this. <laughs> what is what is your process? How did you go about choosing your camera and your mm-hmm. equipment? Yeah, so I'm currently shooting with a Canon 500mm F4 that is the... IS version, the one that's 12 years old, and I'm shooting on a crop sensor camera uh, called the Canon 90D. And I chose a crop sensor camera because um, it actually magnifies um, uh, the focal length. Well, not it technically like multiplies air quotes the the focal length more of like whatever lens you have uh, by the crop factor. And so the crop factor of my camera is 1.6 times. And so shooting that with a 500 millimeter, it looks more like a 640 millimeter, which is about like 11 times magnification. Um, And lots of people, um, like the professional photographers, they use full frames, uh, full frame cameras, which, you know, it's just, um, there's no crop factor to it. And it has lots of benefits, like better in low light, um, shallower depth of field and things like that. Um, but I choose to shoot with a crop sensor because I find the the reach really valuable in uh, yeah just keeping uh, a good distance between me and my subjects and you know typically you know wildlife don't want anything to do with you anyway so um, yeah I think it benefits uh, both me and and the subjects that I photograph. Interesting. What has the mm-hmm. journey of learning about photography been like? Because it's yeah. you just said a lot of words that. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, it's been it's been interesting because I I only learned from YouTube, like just watching tons of YouTube videos, and um, yeah, I knew really nothing about it. I only started in 2019, and I just got obsessed with uh, creating better and better images. I'm like, oh, this needs to look better, or this needs to needs to be more sharp and things like that. And so I just watched a ton. A YouTube videos and I didn't realize until recently when I was teaching like um, uh, photography workshop I was like oh I actually know a lot about <laughs> the settings and things like that that's amazing yeah 
Mm -hmm. What is this? The northern shoveler, or also known as spatula (laughs) clip. Pita. Yes. <laughs> um, that is what you call a dabbling duck. And so there, in the duck family, there are two main groups. So we have like diving ducks and dabbling ducks. So dabbling ducks are the ones that kind of feed on the surface and then they kind of tip their butts up into the air. So if you've seen mallards at your local pond, they're like, you know, their tails are, but are up in the air. And then diving ducks are the ones that have to go underwater and forage for their food that way. Um, so this one is a... Dabbing, dabbling duck, the northern shoveler, and you might have noticed that it has a very large bill. Yeah, it sort of looks like <laughs> uh, a beaver's tail if I were to like mm-hmm. compare it on mm-hmm. its face. Yes, <laughs> very flattering. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a it's a great species to kind of observe because you just see them like swimming through the water with their bills uh, in the water, and they're just sifting. Uh, the water for like invertebrates and things like that. And I've actually documented cool behavior with northern shovelers where, uh, you know, lots of ducks start swimming in circles. They kind of make their own whirlpool. And I was like, what is going on there? Like, you know, it's just, you walk Don't do it. You're going to blow my mind. Don't (laughs) do it. Yeah. They just, you know, large, you know, flock of birds just swimming around in circles in the wetland. You're like, what's going on there? And I learned that they're they're doing this because they're stirring up the sediment um, at the bottom of like uh, the water and like the marsh. And so a lot of like the invertebrates, you know, get you know, suspended in the water and they're filtering it that way. And the more they do it, the more, you know, the bigger the effect is. So <laughs> super cool. Behavior how how so. long do you think it takes for something to develop that skill? Because oh, like gosh, um, yeah. when Paul was describing, like, I think it was the honeybees dancing. He was like, mm-hmm. that takes thousands of years mm-hmm. to develop. Mm-hmm. And like, I believe him, but I also believe that it's possible that these things can be learned quicker than that yeah it depends on like uh the brain (laughs) or the the learning ability of like a particular species right so for crows for example they pick up skills a lot more easier right like they they're quite smart but like how to get food around uh urban areas right and when they see a potato chip they know how to like flip it on uh, a potato uh, like a chip bag they know how to flip it on like the open side and so it it comes out like the food comes out have you what yeah i've seen crows like do that around parking (laughs) lots What? Yeah, like they know, like you know, the opening of the garbage, right? Like a garbage, like a plastic bag. They know which side is which, you know, is open and which is closed, and so they like pull it from like the closed side, so all the food like gets laid up. I <laughs> I swear I'm not doing this on purpose. It's just it keeps freaking my brain out that these things are taking place because I knew that they like they pick up a, a nut and they fly mm-hmm. up high and they drop it. Yeah, that yeah. I'm fine with. Mm-hmm. Picking up a garbage bag from the right side, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that does freaking me out. Yeah, I've definitely seen them do that. <laughs> so the weird thing about ducks, though, really quickly, is mm-hmm. like they have like something weird with their mating, though, right? They have like a curled um, uh, uh, I could penis. They have a yes. curled and then the, but the, the female, they, they can cut it off. Yeah, she also has like... Um, like a, a maze of like, you know. <laughs> yeah, should they, they make it like, so it's like a puzzle piece yes. that you have to like go through to, yes. mm-hmm. and that that's developed because there's such like, um, what is it called? Because dolphins have this a similar problem. Mm-hmm. Um, like just them, like a bird attacking and basically like raping yeah. the, the other bird. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, a lot of like ducks kind of force, um, like the male ducks force themselves upon other females. Yeah. And yeah, in response to that, the females have evolved, you know, uh, corkscrew vaginas as well for like the corkscrew penis. Yeah. Um, and insects have even more interesting adaptations to oh, that. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> so there are, yeah, there are males with like... Uh, like a brush at the end, at the tip of like their reproductory um, organs, where it kind of brushes like the sperm away from like the female's, you know, uh, vagina to like take the sperm away from like uh, other other males who have pr- previously made it with like this particular insect or beetle, for example. And so he wants to make sure that it's only his genes that's you know fertilizing the female. That is crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. What? <laughs> it's yeah, it's insane. 
Mm -hmm. I would never have thought of that. I know that, uh, like, praying mantis is a pretty crazy. And, like, I guess we can't say that, like, what we just discussed is too crazy Mm because, like, black widows kill their spouse after they usually eat them. Yeah. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) do you study, like, spiders when you're studying um, insects? Because they're not, they're not, right? Yeah. They're not. They're not technically insects. Uh, we do have a lab that kind of studies spiders, um, but I never really studied them. Um, yeah, they're more related to like crabs, honestly, than, than insects. Yeah, they're more related. Did you just say they're more related to crabs? Yes. N- no, yeah, they do. No. Yeah, and like lobsters. Yeah. What? Yeah. So people people are saying like, um, for some countries, you know, they they eat uh, spiders. And, you know, they barbecue it or something. And then some people have tried to say, like, oh, it tastes like crab or, like, lobster. <laughs> I guess, like, when you think of how a crab looks, mm-hmm. spiders aren't... Dis- what do you think would win? A crab or a spider if they were in a fight with each other? Um, who, are you, who are you betting on? Um, who are you putting your money on? Well, spiders have, like, venom, so... But, like, what are you going to do with that crab, that shell? That is true. Yeah. Like, bite it in the eye or something. <laughs> yeah, and then the crabs have those pincers. They do, yeah. They could stomp on, on particular spiders. Um, but spiders also have silk, so they could do, like, that little Star Wars thing where they wrap the legs and the crab just falls to the ground. <laughs> I'm really guilty for, like, finding those videos fascinating. Like, uh, <laughs> there's a video of um, an alligator eating another alligator. Wow. And it blew my mind. Yeah. And like, I find that fascinating. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, there was another one of, uh, a, not a cobra. Um, what are they called? They're really predominant in Florida right now. They're like a real problem. Uh, like reticulated pythons? Pythons. Yes. Yeah. And they're, uh, one was eating an alligator. Yeah. That blew, that just blows my, like, it right. just, I don't know why. I like mm-hmm. those weird ones where you're like, what would happen? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It actually happens in real life. It's weird. It's like anacondas, like eating caimans or something. Like, oh. What are caim- more caimans? Caimans are kind of like a smaller alligator. And they're, yeah, they're the quite populous around like the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Super interesting. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah. Now I'm curious as to how that would play out. Because <laughs> yes. even like when you watch like a, a praying mantis mm-hmm. fight like a spider, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and like you realize that like you didn't know who was going to win. Yeah. 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 Okay, now we're on to the Northern Harrier, mm-hmm. which is Circus Hudsonius. Yes. Um, that is a raptor. It's more of like a hawk, actually. Um, but it's its own group called Harriers. And uh, you'll see them like flying over marshes and wetlands. And they typically go for uh, mammal prey, like voles and rodents around. Voles? Voles. Voles. Yes. We're back to voles. Back to voles, yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're, you're right. They are like a, like a hawk, but they've got a mm-hmm. prettier face. They do. Um, a lot of people actually sometimes mis-ID them because their face is quite flat. They look like owls. Um, yeah, but they're similar to owls that they're listening for, you know, rustling or movement around the marsh. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Their hearing's really good, right? Yes. Like crazy. Mm-hmm. All birds are just more... Um, owls especially, um, but yeah, not all of them have like the sim- similar adaptation. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, this one has got to be the cutest. For people just <laughs> listening, you need to go onto his web- website, Chris Koo, K R I S C U. If you're if you're just listening, and you need to go see the barred owlet. It is the cutest thing. Like you need a picture of this owl in your house. He, he just, this is what you need to wake up to in the morning. This is adorable. It is like a little fluff ball with black eyes. It is so adorable. Please tell us about the Strix Varia. Yeah. Um, bar dolls are great. Um, I ran into this particular one. Uh, it's not shown in the photo, but there were actually four or five owls that day. And I was just out for a stroll in the in my local forest, you know, just birding, seeing what's around. And then I hear like the sharp um, call, which is a begging call of the owl. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's owls around here. What does that sound like? Uh, I don't want to be, yeah, I don't want to be <laughs> weird. But so like, again, this is just like the most fluffy looking owl. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful because it's got this green backdrop. So you, it really pops out and... Yeah, I just, I think you're an amazing photographer and it's just so cool to see these photos and yeah, this is just an adorable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will play the call for you.
That is crazy. Mm -hmm. So that is the um, that's like the begging call of like uh, an outlet. Like hungry. Yes. Like need like need. Give me food. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. So imagine just walking around your forest and you hear that and you're like, oh, you know. Again, you know, if you want to get into like wildlife and nature photography, you, you it's good to know. It's very helpful to know, like, to know who's making that sound. You're like, oh, you can tell immediately. Oh, that's an owl. You know, that's worth um, photographing. You're trying to photograph. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you did you know when you heard that you were like, that's an owl? Yes, I've heard that one before. Yeah. And I've seen them, I've seen the juveniles before I make that call. Do you listen to that prior? Like, do you, is that like something you need to look into when you're researching? You absolutely can. And it's great with, you know, apps like Merlin. Um, they have, you know, which is what I'm using now. They have like the list of uh, the calls and songs of like a particular bird. And so you can practice anywhere you'd like. That just mm -hmm. Merlin. <laughs> just Merlin app? Yes, Merlin. Available on like Apple and yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All free. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about the American Robin, mm -hmm. which has got that beautiful orangey color, and Turtis migratorius. Ooh, mm -hmm. I like that word, migratorius. Migratorius, yeah. American Robins are, are great. They, um, yeah, a lot of people kind of pass them over because, you know, they, you see them all over the place. Um, but it's a great species. They're quite vocal. Um, it actually fooled me when I first started birding because they have so many different calls and you have like three or four and you have to learn all of them and you realize, oh, it's, it's just the robin. It's not like a different bird. It's all robin. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was shot during like a, a snowfall in um, in Vancouver and I noticed them like feeding on, on these berries and I was like, oh, that would be a great photo to, to snap up. Yeah, it's beautiful mm -hmm. because the berries have got like... A little snow on them, mm -hmm. and there's snow falling in the background. Mm -hmm. What do you know? What type of berries those are? I feel like we can't eat those. It's it's passing me, but I did I did look into those berries. I can't remember it right now. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, beautiful photo. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so what we're looking at for people just listening is like when you go to uh, like an exhibition park where they play games at night, and they've got those big lights, and then there is a great horned owl on it. Again, Bubo Virginius. Mm -hmm. And it is sitting, but it's just, it's like a silhouette almost. Mm -hmm. I just learned that word last week. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, this was, uh, this was also interesting because, um, this was early in, um, uh, March or fe February, sorry. Um, owls typically, uh, start calling and breeding, uh, quite a bit earlier than, uh, other birds. So they start, um, hooting and climbing toward ter territory around like February. Um, and so I found, uh, this owl and his mate around this local forest, uh, which is very close to like a, a neighborhood. And they would just hoot around dusk. And this particular male, he flew to the light stand and he just sat there for, <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> Called out a couple times and then flew back to the forest and be like, okay, this patch is mine. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you ever feel like it's just luck or is it strategy? Like this photo just seems like yeah. so unique, but it feels like it needs to be on the front cover of a book. Oh, yeah. Um, this is definitely luck. Um, you know. I I wasn't intending to, you know, I didn't have this photo in mind when I went to look for the owls, but uh, they flew, you know, he flew right to the stand and I was like, okay, I got to get a shot of that. That's pretty good. Yeah, that, that is an amazing photo. Yeah. And the ears too, I love that. Yeah, because well, it really stands yeah. out. Mm -hmm. And this is Northern Harrier. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful because it's more of a front end. Mm -hmm. How big is that wingspan? Um... Like if you had to guess. That's a great question. Um, they're not terribly large. Maybe about like the size of this desk. That's Which, really, yeah, that's a, really bit, a little bit smaller, I think. Yeah. yeah. Th does mm -hmm. that impress you at all about birds though? How crazy the wingspan is? Uh-huh. You should see a wandering. Oh, I have a photo of a wandering oh. albatross next to a person. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I will just sh uh, find this. So that's how big that bird is. Oh my gosh. So for people just listening, this is, the wingspan is bigger than the person. It is, mm -hmm. looks like a person probably 5'8", 5'9", mm -hmm. and then the wingspan, even the body of it is like the size of this guy's body. Like it is crazy how wide it is and then like the wingspan is far longer than the person. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Um, 
And so that's the albatross. Yeah, that's the wandering albatross, uh, world's largest albatross. Um, oh, that's the photo of the... A wandering albatross. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We will try and put that up on the video for yes, people to watch. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're looking at a California quail. Mm -hmm. Very, what, what very a weird, cute. <laughs> what a weird looking in comparison to what we've looked at so far. And I don't even, Calipepla mm -hmm. californica. I like that, Californica. Californica, yeah. So California quails are introduced in BC. They, um, yeah, they've become quite established, but they were introduced uh, for hunting purposes. <laughs> um, people like, you know, to hunt them for game. Um, but yeah, they're quite common around the Okanagan. And you see them like walking around near urban neighborhoods and running around streets. And yeah, the males look very dashing. They've got a little crest that goes above their head. Um, very weird, but very charismatic birds, I would say. Here's a fun fact about quails. Did you know that Vice President Dick Cheney uh, shot somebody that he knows uh, when he went quail hunting? Oh, my. Yeah. That's not good. I'm pretty sure when he was vice president. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and people should go check out the movie Vice. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good movie. Oh, dear. <laughs> Oh, these are, see, these are adorable. So mm -hmm. we're, we're at the great horned owlets. Are these different than the ones we were just looking at before, the other owlets? Yes, that was different. Uh, so baby are owls different. are just adorable in general. They are. They're just fluff balls and they look like Muppets and it's great. I, I like owls. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I'd be one of those terrible people who'd only want them when they're a baby because <laughs> yes. they're really, really cute. Yes. It literally looks like they're just a bag of snow with mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. It's basically just fluff. Yeah. Like down. It's supposed to keep them warm and they don't have flight feathers. So, um, yeah, this photo was, um, was incredible. Um, like the experience itself was incredible. Um, I found them around five minutes away from my house and they, I found the adults had a nest on like this big leaf maple that was quite deep into a park. And I had to use a two times teleconverter. And what that is, it magnifies uh, the focal length of your lens uh, by two times. So if a 500 millimeter is like a 10 times magnification, it becomes like a 20 times magnification with this, like this little piece of gear. Uh, that's how far away they were. And I photographed these owls uh, during uh, dawn. Um, they're quite adventurous, like this time of year, because uh, they start wandering off. They get a little bit restless away from their nest. You know, it's getting crowded for them. <laughs> and so I saw them, you know, like perched upon this this beautiful big leaf maple, and there's like licorice fern going all around there. And I was like, oh gosh, I gotta take a photo of this. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So. Do you have to have your camera stabilized on something? Because like Absolutely. you think of like when you, the more you zoom in, the more you like any sort of movement, the the more difficult, like the more blurry the photo is if you move. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is another one of those uh, challenging uh, photographs to capture sharp because uh, it has to be really stable. So there hasn't, there's not supposed to be like a ton of wind around. Um, and then it's during uh, dawn, so very low light, and you have to um, open your shutter up really big, uh, extended periods of time. And what the two times teleconverter does, uh, the downside to magnifying your your focal length is that it cuts the amount of light coming into your lens. And so you have to expose the shutter even longer to get the same amount of light um, without using a teleconverter versus with using it. Um, and so yeah, very photographic, uh, very challenging photograph to take, but I think this is one of like two images that came out sharp. That's amazing though, <laughs> yeah. because like how many photos of gray horn outlets do you think exist? A ton. You think so? A ton. Yeah. People love owls. I've just never seen any other than <laughs> your, your photo. Yes. Like when you think of like common, it's like on mm -hmm. Instagram, is it common? Like, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, definitely. Mm -hmm. Wow. Owls are very popular uh, photographic subjects uh, in wildlife photography. The great horned owlets? Uh, all, all owls, all species of owls. Yeah. People go crazy for owls. <laughs> so you said you took these at dawn. Mm -hmm. What is dawn to you? Uh, that, How early are you getting up for this? About, well, I have to get to location around 45 minutes before sunrise, uh, which gets harder uh, through the summer, <laughs> um, which is primarily why I like winter shooting so much because I wake up a little bit later. Um, so what time are you getting up? Like what, what does that look like over like in? Yeah, this time of year around like 
5 to 5.30, depending on where I'm driving to. Uh, because once you get to location, you have to set up, and then you have to walk to where the spot is. And that could be more or less time, depending on the location, right? That's incredible. Yeah. And then, you know, that really nice liver of light only happens with like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then it's gone. <laughs> Can you tell us what that is? Again, I had uh, Alex Hart on, who's a photographer, mm -hmm. and uh, he does grad photos by donation. Um, oh. He was trying to like support the community, and people were graduating and not able to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so he was trying to use his photography skill to like give back to the community and make like celebrating your graduation accessible. You can do photos outside, so it was more accessible. And he was explaining the process of like taking photos during these small periods of time, it still wrinkles my brain. So could you explain that? Yeah. So um, typically the light is best when it's kind of more horizontal um, versus vertical, like coming down from the top of you. So that's what we call like golden, golden hour or blue hour after the sun sets. Um, that's when the light is a little bit softer, it's a little bit more pleasing versus like the harsh uh, midday sun. Um, and typically that's the best time to photograph wildlife as well, because it's when they're most active, like dawn and dusk, you know, they're getting hungry or they're just waking up. So they're, uh, they're looking for food and things like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work. Like this is, <laughs> this is not happened by accident. It's a lot of work for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the red breasted sapsucker, well, mm -hmm. that's fun to say, uh, cipher picus rubber. Mm -hmm. Did I say that one right? Yes, you did. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is actually a type of woodpecker uh, called the sapsucker. And what they do is they drill little holes into like uh, Douglas fir trees and sap comes out and then they lap the sap up and then they fly to another tree and drill another hole. And so if you see a tree with like neatly drilled holes in it, it looks like somebody, you know, um, just excavated it so so perfectly it's the work of sap suckers oh my gosh <laughs> yeah. that's really cool so their mm -hmm. beak has to be like probably reinforced or something yes right? very sharp yeah their um their whole anatomy is uh, uh similar to woodpeckers you know they they're built to withstand like the force of like banging your head against the tree <laughs> oh my gosh i actually was uh through the um what is it called a hunter gatherer's guide to the 21st century they were talking about how um, like we are not a blank slate as human beings, but we are the blankest slate there is. Um, so that doesn't mean that we're not, we're just a blank slate, but we're the blankest slate there is. The cool thing about people is that we can do so many different things. Mm -hmm. We can figure out what our passion is and go share that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always try and stress in, in every episode with each person is because uh, the last person prior to you was a person who was fascinated by leather work and heritage yeah. items and making leather by hand and like that process. That's completely different than what you're doing. Yeah. And we have something to learn from each person who figures out what that is and shares that and shares how they go about working on their craft. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, and maybe you can share... What has the development over time been like for you to like improve and to see, I didn't like your first photo probably wasn't your favorite photo. Mm -hmm. You've grown and developed and improved over time. So what has that mm -hmm. journey sort of been like for you? Um, it's been, it's been really great to try and like challenge yourself to like, you know, reach another level, um, particularly with like the technical aspects of photography, right? Um, because so many things, uh, you have to have your like image sharp, and also you have to have like really good light, or you have to find your subject, and you know sometimes you have to try a different sort of exposure to give it more unique feel to your image. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been great with the social media, especially and like photo competitions, because you see like the standard and the level of like photography that other photographers are, are doing, and you're like, wow, that's really great. Like I haven't tried that technique or. Um, I love the way he used like the light in this photo and yeah, it's really great to kind of experiment and learn more and explore um, other styles. So you're not just, you know, shooting like flat light every time, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that challenging at all? Does it, um, the, the question I always have is like, does it ever become a job? Does it ever become like where you're competing? Like maybe there's like a financial incentive to be in this competition mm -hmm. so that you can continue doing the work you do, but then it's not... It's not what it was. It's it's now like a task and you have to like is is there ever a challenge with trying to balance your passion for nature mm -hmm. with the technical job kind of more aspects of it? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, especially with like uh, my friends tell me I'm really hard on my myself and my photos. Like I'm always saying like, oh, th you know, there's something else that can be like improved on this image. Like there's something else that could be uh, tweaked or it could look better this way. Or, you know, a different perspective. Um, so it gets challenging sometimes uh, and frustrating that you're like. Uh, you have something you want in your head, but you're not getting it again because you know nature photography things have to align, and yeah, you just have to be persistent. You know, just keep trying, and yeah. How often is it better than you expected? Is it is it like typically typically in your head you have like a standard that you'd like it to be, and yes. it doesn't reach that, or is it just different? Um, for better or for worse, there's typically a standard that I'm trying to achieve with my photos. And I've become really stubborn, especially with light. Um, like if it's past, like a, you know, it doesn't. It's not like orange or red or what I'm looking for. I'm like, ah, whatever. I'll just put my camera away and just go birding. <laughs> wow. So you're you're really tough on yourself in that way. Yeah. 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 I think so. I think my friends tell me that too. Um, but the end is, result is something that I'm actually going to be proud of, right? Like I can say, like, oh, I really worked hard to to get this image. Like the bittern, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So is it good to, because like for me, what I find helps is like a distance. So like I always go through a podcast and re-listen to it to mm -hmm. see, did I ask good questions? Did it, like, was I engaging? Could I have asked a better question? I go through and I try and see like, maybe you should have, um, like you followed up too quickly with another question instead of letting the person kind of find their way on a thought or something. Like mm -hmm. I, I really try and hone in on that, but I need to give myself like, a week and a bit to, or two weeks to distance myself so I kind of forget what I said, like yeah. exactly how I phrased something mm -hmm. because then I will be too hard on myself. When you look back at mm -hmm. some of the photos we're looking at now, is it easier to go like, that's a great photo? Or are you going back to like, I was standing here and I should have been standing there and like, this is the light. Like, is yeah. it, do you still go there or is it easy to look at these photos and go like, that's great? Um, I don't think I'm ever going to be satisfied with like the photos I take. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe just like the artist did me. Um, but yeah, when I look at a photo, I'm just like, oh, you know, there's something that else that could be like changed or improved with this, or uh, I should have tried a different technique. And so that's one of the, the things that keep pulling me back to like the field, right? Like, oh, I got to try something different or... Um, yeah, I got to experiment like different sort of light and got to find a different location for this particular bird. Yeah. Why do you take photos? Cause like you can say like, well, I'm going out there. I want to see it. But like, are you taking photos for your own catalog? Like, mm -hmm. do you have a binder at home or are you doing this? So other people see, cause like for me, when you're taking photos, I get to see what you see. I get to see the beauty of these animals mm -hmm. in a different light than if, because when we when you walk through a trail, you're just sort of like, oh, there's a there's a crow, oh, there's an eagle, mm -hmm. but there are people like you who make. Um, there was somebody who did a good job of explaining this. They took photos of like a barrel of hay, just at different times. Wow! And yeah. you just see the differences in the hay depending on the light over time, and you realize that this barrel of hay is different in different lighting and and yeah. how different it is, but. It's a barrel of hay and most yeah. people are like, who cares? Mm -hmm. But that's what photography and artwork is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you see something through the eyes of the photographer. Mm -hmm. And so what what makes you take photos? Like what, what brings you to like you get to see it and you could be like, I got to see it. So mm -hmm. it's a good day. Mm -hmm. So where does the photography come in for you? I think uh, for the most part, I really just want to showcase uh, my subjects and like the interesting lives uh, that they lead and the unique adaptations that they have. Um, uh, for example, with the bittern, like, you know, it calling and like it hiding around the marsh, and, like lots of people never get to see that, right? Uh, unless you're a birder or something. Um, and so, you know, capturing those images and like sharing like little slivers of that particular animal's life to, to other people, which normally they won't be able to see, you know, is something that really drives me. And it's like a huge privilege. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I think, I think you should be really proud of yourself because these photos <laughs> are just, just amazing. Yeah. Is it ever tough doing photos though? Because like part of what you want is like the video element. And I know you do post videos on, on your, your Instagram page, mm -hmm. but is that ever like the, the challenge of photos is you don't get to hear it. You don't get to see yeah. it move. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's definitely some scenes where video, um, uh, comes more in handy versus photos. For example, like a huge flock of birds flying, you know, it's, it would be great to see that in video versus like a still form. 
Um, so it's just picking like the appropriate moment or uh, yeah, the the right time to to post the video. Interesting. Yeah. Did you actually run into a, a black bear? I did. Yes, that was um, that was actually during a road trip with my uh, with my good friend Derek. Uh, we were yeah doing a road trip to the Rockies, and we saw this bear across the road, and we just pulled over next to it. And as it was rummaging through the vegetation, it just poked its head up for a bit. We took we snapped the photo of the bear, and then went about its business. <laughs> That's so wild. I find yeah. bears so interesting because they're so much like dogs. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. There's lots of people saying, you know, uh, bears are super dangerous or things like that. And they can be if you if you threaten them or you corner them. Uh, but for the most part, most wildlife don't want anything to do with you. Yeah, what's crazy is humans are dangerous. Like, <laughs> yes. well, that's just so crazy that people are like, you know, bears are dangerous. It's like, you know what's more likely going to, like, attack you out of nowhere? Somebody driving their car down the road. Yep. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah, when you encounter them, they just, you know, they look at you and then they, they walk away or they run away and then they care about their business. Yeah, the one experience I had, I was up in Whistler with mm -hmm. my uncle and this is not something I recommend, but I was between um, a bear oh, no. and her cub. Yeah. And uh, so I just, just kept slowly walking and uh, they ended up heading into the forest and everything was fine. But it was up in Whistler, so mm -hmm. they're not uncommon there, but it was like... Oh, this is the exact circumstance literally everyone says to avoid. Yes. <laughs> uh, so now we're looking at, oh my gosh, an Anna's hummingbird, or I'm not even going to try. What yep. Did, what did you, you go uh, ahead. That is the Calypte Anna. Okay. Yeah. Um, great hummingbird that is local all, all year round around here in Vancouver. Um Interestingly enough, they stick around in Vancouver because people started leaving hummingbird feeders all around throughout the year. And typically they're only found like more uh, central to Southern California, but they've expanded slowly because of hummingbird feeders. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a great species to have around and yeah, it's beautiful to see them like with the males in their gorget and yeah. Hummingbirds are crazy, right? Like their heartbeat is pretty insane. Yeah, they're, I feel like hummingbirds are either on or off. It's like they're either buzzing around or just like sitting still and not doing much. I've never seen a hummingbird sitting still. Oh, really? No. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you, can, um, you can hear them around, actually. Uh, the anas are quite common. If you hear... I'm going to play it again for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> if you hear a, um, a rasping sort of noise, uh, it's pretty typical of a anas hummingbird. And a good place to look for it is like on the tops of, or the tips of like branches because that's typically where they sing. So I'm going to play this song for you. That's so great. So yeah, you'll just hear that like, you know, like a metallic sort of rasping noise. You're like, oh, that's a hummingbird. Yeah. Interesting. It doesn't have a very nice voice. No, it doesn't. No. That's unfortunate because they're so beautiful and they're so, yeah. they're so curious. I, also, fun fact, did you know that praying mantises can take out a hummingbird? I have seen like photos of, yeah, praying mantises just eating hummingbirds. I'm like, oh my gosh, invertebrates win this one. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have a, a clock that's a bird clock. Oh, nice. I thought that was coming from outside. No. That's awesome. <laughs> a river otter, the Lantra... Cadenesis. Ca yeah, Cadenesis. Um, yeah, this was uh, <laughs> a very interesting start to this image. <laughs> this is when I was like first starting uh, photographing um, wildlife, and I was out with a bunch of friends in the Okanagan, and we were out at this semi-frozen lake, and I noticed there was a spot where um, it wasn't completely frozen and there was an otter that was like playing around the snowbanks. So what I did was I started walking on like, um, this lake and it got pretty far to try and get close to this otter, um, which I don't think I'll do again. <laughs> um, but I could see like where I was stepping, like it was, you know, uh, it was kind of sinking and just only like a few <laughs> inches, I guess, that it's actually frozen. Um... But yeah, I snapped this photo as this otter popped out of his hole. And then after that, I was like, yeah, this isn't safe. I'm going to go back. Oh, my gosh. Shark. What you're willing to do for an amazing photo. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that again. I think it was a little too, just too risky. <laughs> yeah. But for people just listening, it's like the otter is literally looking at the camera. Mm-hmm. Like I can't get my cat to look at a camera. You've got an otter in the water. Like mm-hmm. it's just crazy. Yeah, just poked his head out for a few seconds, dove right back in. I was like, thank you, I'm, I'm going now. <laughs> That's amazing. The you've mentioned this one, the American Dipper, mm-hmm. uh, Sinkless. Mexicanus. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an amazing songbird that just, you know, lives on the creek and dives in fast flowing water. And yeah, they're just a joy to watch. Wow. It's really uh, like, it's got a fat body. Mm-hmm. It's quite round. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is there re- like, doesn't seem like it's that water dynamic. You would think that, but uh, they're quite comfortable. Like they pop out of the water. They're still quite dry and yeah, the feathers are pretty waterproof and yeah. Do people collect feathers? Like weird people, like, okay, yeah. lazy people seem to just collect like one eagle feather. Mm-hmm. But do real birders collect feathers? Um, yeah, there are people who collect feathers. Uh, I believe there's an organization that's kind of uh, against collecting feathers and, and things like that. Um, oh, why? Like, I, do obviously don't rip them off the bird. Yeah, but, yeah, but sometimes, uh, yeah, there are feathers, you know, that you just find lying around and... People, yeah, there are definitely people collect them. Um, I personally don't, but uh, yeah. Interesting. Definitely a place for that. Yeah. I'd be interested to know why you would not support. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this, this, does this win the prize for the weirdest looking duck that there is? Uh, it's called the Mandarin duck. For people just lis- listening, imagine a duck mates with a mandarin. And that's sort of what we're looking at here. Uh, Aches galeric. Nope. Yep. (laughs) Galaricata. Yes. Um, So this is actually an introduced uh, species. This this is a local uh, known as Trevor. He is in Burnaby Lake most of the time. Uh, Trevor? Trevor. His name is Trevor. So there's only one. Yes, there's only one uh, male mandarin duck uh, in Burnaby Lake. And I just, yeah, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. They look so good. (laughs) Who named him Trevor? (laughs) I don't know, but it's reference to um, the Mandarin in like Iron Man, um, like Iron Man 3. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's why they called him Trevor. No, that makes sense. Yeah, because the bad guy, it, he ended up not being like the main villain. Yeah. But it was Trevor. But his name is Trevor. It's the Mandarin. Like, yeah, that is hilarious. Trevor. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're ever in Burnaby Lake, you might see Trevor around hanging out with the other wood ducks. <laughs> wood ducks? Yeah, it's not his species, but he likes to, you know, mate with the, the female wood ducks there. <laughs> can he? He can, yeah, oh. but they don't really produce, like, viable young. Oh, um, yeah. so he can't. He he does it for fun, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Trevor. Mm-hmm. These barred owls, they're... The, do you have a favorite owl? Do you have a bias for an owl? I'm definitely a little bit biased towards like the great horned owl. Interesting. Um, I'm biased for this barred owl. Yeah, the barred owls are great. Um, barred. I'm yes. saying bared. Like yeah, barred. Barred, barred owl. Okay. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, they're kind. Uh, they're technically invasive. The the barred owls because uh, they're native to the east coast, but they slowly started expanding to the west coast through like. 1970s or 80s, I believe. And, you know, they do really well in urban environments. And I've seen photos of, like, barred owls perched on bus signs, uh, which That's is crazy. Really, that is really crazy. I appreciate yeah. them for coming out. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, they're kind of displacing our, our native, uh, like, western screech owls uh, on the coast. Oh, uh, what's a screech owl? It's a, a smaller owl that has really beautiful song that I will also play for you. Please play it for <laughs> me, because I think this is really cool. Yes. Um, so lots of birds make noises that, you know, you don't associate with like a typical songbird song. And this Western screech owl is described to have a song uh, like a bouncing ball. And I'll play the duet for you. So it's that like um like the bouncing ball sort of noise. That is so wild. Yeah. Cuz so it cool. had to have happened before we had balls that bounced. Yep. Mhm. 
But it just sounds like you know, like a bouncing ball. Like, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that is so beautiful so and cool. so. Yeah. This is so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a common loon, Gavia immer. For people just listening, uh, it's got a ble- beautiful black and white body. Um, it looks kind of like it's got like a penguin type kind of black and white neck. Mm-hmm. And then it's got red, dark red eyes. Dark red eyes. Yeah. Um, common loons are great. Uh, they're, they're the bird on our loony on our coin. Um, and yeah, very here on the coast when during the winter, they look completely different from this. They, they're just kind of like gray white ish. And most people just pass them over like, oh, whatever, you know, but during the breeding season, they, they have like these breeding plumage and they look just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and they breed in like interior regions of the province. So you really won't find them around the coast during the summer. But if you go to like Kamloops or the Okanagan and you go to, any lake that's kind of stocked with um, uh, steelhead, tr- steelhead trout or rain- rainbow trout, uh, uh, because people do that, uh, you'll find loons and their their chicks. Uh, it's really cute because the chicks ride on the back of the parents' uh, <laughs> back. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had a photo. I I, t- I think I took it down from the website, but um, it's super cute. They're just resting on the back, and you know they're just getting carried around <laughs> with their parents. That's amazing. <laughs> Wow. Love loons. When we agree that we're not going to get, like, Trevor was pretty crazy. This this looks like a mess. Yes. It's called the Yellow Rumped Warbler, mm-hmm. Setophaga coronata. Mm-hmm. Cor- coronata. Yeah. And it looks unwell. It looks, <laughs> it's got yellow on its top of its head, on its chin, mm-hmm. on its arm. And then it's black, white, and gray. Yeah. Yeah, warblers are are a very um, bright group of birds. Um, these are the songbirds that migrate up to um, uh, Canada during the spring and summer months. Right. And the yellow rump warblers is one of uh, one of the first arrivals that come. So, yeah, they're actually here already. And so it's kind of a signal that, you know, all the songbirds, spring songbirds are coming. Um, but, yeah, this particular photo, the... Uh, the warbler is actually fluffing out its feathers right. and it's like a slower shutter speed. That's why it looks a little bit blurry. Um, that I think it gives the impression of like motion uh, to the bird. But yeah, very gorgeous little songbird. Yeah, their hands are quite different. Is there like a logic? Like, because some, I guess, go in the water more and, and some go in the water less. Mm-hmm. So how do they go about developing their, their hands? Uh, you mean their feet? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Hands. Feet. Claws. Yes. Talons. <laughs> they don't have hands. Yes. <laughs> Come on, Aaron. It would be great, though, if they did. Uh, it would be very entertaining. Um, but, yeah, it depends. Um, the evolution of their feet depends on, like, what they're used for. So, um, you know, re- yellow rump warblers and songbirds, they have feet that, that are developed for perching. So... Um, that's typically why they're a little bit more skinny and they're just supposed to support the bird versus raptors that have like thicker legs and like talons or, uh, loons, for example, they have web feet. And so it helps them paddle through the water more. Um, yeah. So different adaptations. That's crazy. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. just interesting to see like orange feet versus like black talons. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Oh, these barred owls, they've got me. Yeah, they, they're beautiful. <laughs> I'm interested in these screech owls because you're saying that they're pretty cute too. Yeah. I don't think I still have the photo of a screech owl I had up there, but um, yeah, beautiful. A spotted tauhi or piplo macalatus. Mm-hmm. So spotted towies are uh, common birds. How did I just say it? <laughs> tauhi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Like... <laughs> I didn't know how to pronounce this properly before. <laughs> say it how you're supposed to say it. Spotted toey. <laughs> it's like, it's so not, it's so like English. It's like not my first language yes. when I say it. Oh, no. Okay. So <laughs> um, but yeah, these are one of like the, the songbirds that we have locally that uh, they like to hide around bushes during the winter. Um, and they make like cat call sounds. It's very interesting. Um, cat call sounds. Yes, they sound like the like cat's purring. Or um, yeah, the purr is a weird one, right? Like uh, 
it's weird how cats are able to like make their purring sounds. Yeah, it is. I, like, I think that there's something about it that's like, it's strange that they're able to do what they do. Like, I don't think they have like, mm-hmm. they're not supposed to be able to purr. I don't think it's something weird like it's that. It's a very, yeah, weird vocal. Um, but don't trust me. I just pronounce it Tawhi. <laughs> yes. Uh Let's see if this is the right one. Like that, like a purr. Wow. Yeah, so you just hear that like around the bushes and you can tell it's like a spotted hooey. Yeah, that is really interesting. Mm-hmm. They're so different. Yeah, birds make, yeah, I feel like bird songs and calls are a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, and something like you could spend a lot of time on just focused on that. Yeah, there are people who just dedicate, you know, their, their birding career is just collecting um, audio from songs and calls from the birds. And that's why we have like a great library like this. That has all, <laughs> yeah. all the sounds they make. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So we're looking at Rufus here, Rufus the hummingbird, mm-hmm. Rufus hummingbird, or Salasphorus Rufus. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful orange, bright orange. Um, how did you take this photo, man? Yeah, that's... Uh... This is crazy. This, like, you have to go look at these photos because <laughs> I just can't do them justice when I'm describing them with my terrible <laughs> descriptions. Um yeah, Rufus hummingbirds are, are one of those migrants that come up uh, during the spring and summer months again. They're quite aggressive. They will chase, I've seen them chase robins around out of, you know, just because they're trying to establish a territory and they just chase robins around the forest and you know, all these poor birds. And they're quite small too, so <laughs> it's kind of funny to see. <laughs> um, but yeah, this photo I took when I found this Rufus hummingbird. Um, they have favorite purchase when they uh, go into like a specific park or forest. Uh, they have select purchase that they like to rest in and sing from. And so I found this photogenic one um, with like moss and lichen uh, at the end of it. And this Rufus hummingbird just perfectly <laughs> chose this uh, photogenic perch. And so I just set up my camera and then whenever he come back every like 40 minutes, I try to take photos. <laughs> um so do you know yeah. that there's people out there that will set up like what looks like a natural environment and then put the yes. animal in to take the photo to make it look like the photos you're taking? Yes, um, for sure. Uh, that happens a lot with like feeder birds, for example. So they have like feeders set up and then um, next to the feeder, they have like really beautiful photogenic perches like this one. And so when the bird comes, they land on the perch, you take your photos and then uh, they go to the feeder and then they fly away, right? No, I'm talking about people who have like oh. buildings and oh. they take like, they, these are like not native, like they take the bird, put it in oh, the, so like in a container that looks natural to take the photos that you have. Oh, that's not good at all. <laughs> yeah. It's way more common than I realized. But like when oh, you dear. see like really cool photos of like certain bugs and stuff, yeah. oftentimes they're just taking that, putting it into like a container and making it look like the photos you're taking. So I just want to yeah. give huge credit <laughs> that you're like out there waiting for this bird to land. And for people, for folks just listening, it's mm-hmm. literally on a branch looking up with its chin up Mm -hmm. and it's just like it's a picture perfect photo and other people like if you go online certain photos that you're going to see you're going to be like wow that looks so natural but behind the scenes there's this big company that has the animal brought in to take that photo and i didn't know that and so i just want to shine light on the fact that you're out there with a camera hoping for the best yeah for sure and again that's one of like my targets with my photography right like i want to do it ethically and um i just got lucky that i found this rufus hummingbird uh perched on this beautiful photogenic uh branch um but otherwise it would, you know it's not ethical at all to like try to manipulate an environment uh just for your photo <laughs> and for yeah. likes and yeah. that's the problem is that like likes run so much of people's success online mm-hmm. and they're willing to trade in their ethical responsibilities yeah oh i just it. love these photos of these outlets so cute. And yours is your one of your favorites is the great horned owl. Eh? Yes, that's correct. Um, it's because uh, when I was in Summerland, I found uh, a nesting family of great horned owls like five minutes away from uh, the place I was renting at, and I spent almost every day just walking up that forest and just observing what they were doing. Uh, I didn't. I think I got like two photos out of like the whole summer, which was kind of 
Yeah, it's all right. But I learned so much about like their behavior and what they like to do. Uh, I learned that they have favorite perches. I learned that, um, you know, the mother is always close by the chicks when they start fledging and things like that. So uh, definitely biased because of that, because I spent a great deal of time just observing them with like a notebook and just writing down, oh, you know, uh, the mom is facing uh, this side of the canyon uh, today. And then she's on like this other tree today, like the, the height and like where the chick is and things like that. Wow, so you you take like real notes on these things? Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah. So I find the notes like very valuable um, because even just the process of writing it down, you know, it instills in your memory a little bit easier. Um, and yeah, I don't always walk away with a photo, but that's okay. I learned something else. <laughs> that's so that's so humble. So, how mm-hmm. long do you think it takes for you to like research something in comparison to taking going out and taking photos of it? Like, what is kind of that that timeline for you? Yeah, um, research definitely takes a lot more than, uh, um, yeah, photographing our subjects and depends on how like cryptic or elusive the subject is, the more time you have to spend in the field actually looking for it, right? Um, so there's lots of owl species that uh, I would like to get photos of, but I just haven't been able to find them because they're so difficult. <laughs> right. Um and yeah, there's like unethical ways of doing it. Like you could use like the call of the owl to try and attract it to you. But I, yeah, again, I don't want to disturb them that way. Like I want to find them naturally and just let them do their own thing. And I'm just there to take a snapshot of their life. Yeah. And you said you haven't been doing as much nature photography, mm-hmm. perhaps as you'd like. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I work full time for Birds Canada as well. And yeah, I just... Um, I only have like a couple hours a week where I can actually dedicate to like nature photography and you might not get a photo every week. And so you have to try next week and the week after that and things like that. Is that a tough part? Like, would you like, if you could, Mm -hmm. if you had a grant that Mm -hmm. just said you can take as many photos as you like, spend all your days, would that Mm -hmm. be what you'd rather be doing? Um, or do you like the work that you're doing? Like, I do love the work that I'm doing with Birds Canada, like sharing my passion to others, having like webinars and talking about birds and leading bird walks and, sh- you know, sharing the world of birds and the natural world to other people is very rewarding to me, uh, especially since I grew up without it. And it's nice, really nice to see people like get excited over uh, species that kind of passed over me, like Anna's hummingbirds, you know, I've seen them forever. <laughs> and to see somebody like, oh my gosh, you know, I've never seen a hummingbird up close it's really rewarding um but also yeah just the fact that my style of nature photography just takes so much time uh it'd be great to like have it to do it like in a semi-professional capacity and i'm hopefully working towards that as well that's amazing and Mm so can you tell us about how you got started with birds canada and and sort of the work that you do yeah um so about two summers ago, I applied to the job and th- this communications job that I'm in. And I fortunately, unfortunately, I didn't get it because I was going back to school and they wanted somebody a little bit more long term. Um, but after that person kind of left and pursued uh, their own like career, um, Birds Canada reached out to me again and be like, hey, you know, it's open now if you'd like to join us and actually um, do this work. You know, and I was very enthusiastic. We said, yes, please. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I do like communications and outreach for them. So lots of different forms of like article writing, and photography, videography. Um, yeah, reviewing, editing, uh, uh, writing and social media and things like that. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the tours that you do and some of the spots that you go to? Yeah, so I also lead bird walks with mainly with the BC Bird Trail. Um, So uh, that is with BC Bird Trail and Stanley Park Ecology Society. And so that's around Stanley Park and uh, just around the lower mainland in general. And it's great to just kind of invite people to go birding and the... The, the video that me, you mentioned a while ago was with um, this uh, program with Stanley Park Ecology Society called Birding With Me. And it's basically an idea or an activity where people of like a shared identity kind of go out together and with like an expert birder from their community as well to like lead these bird walks and provide like these opportunities in nature that otherwise wouldn't be there. 
Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so you said Stanley Park, and then the spot I think you were at was Blackie Spit. Yes. Can you tell us about like what people would expect to see in those two locations? Mm -hmm. So those are quite different locations. So Stanley Park is more of like a coastal, uh, rocky intertidal sort of area. Um, some deciduous forests around, some evergreens around there, and then Blackie Spit is definitely more of like a, a sandy beach sort of habitat and more deciduous. So. Um, different variation in the birds. Like there's definitely more marine ducks uh, out at Stanley Park during the winter, and then there's more um, like songbirds and woodpeckers around uh, Blackie Spit. Interesting. Do you have a preference? My grandmother loved Blackie Spit, mm -hmm. so I'm just curious as to what what do you think she saw in Blackie Spit? Um, it's very accessible, so you know it's great to have a place where uh, you don't have to hike like. 20 kilometers up a steep hill just to go birding, right? Um, it's very vibrant. There's lots of people there you can talk to and, you know, share your passion about birds and lots of diversity in the habitat as well. So um, with diverse uh, habitats, that attracts lots of different kinds of species. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so where do you hope to go sort of in the future? Do you have like an idea of um, if you have your way where things would go over time? Yeah, um, I'm not entirely sure on that um, because I currently enjoy my work uh, with Birds Canada and yeah, just being able to do photography in like a semi-professional capacity, that is something I'm working towards and like uh, having mentorships or selling prints to coffee shops, that sort of things would be great. Um, yeah, instead of, you know, just having my photos live on like a drive or just social media, actually making some sort of income out of it. That's what I was going to ask. How yeah. do you go about taking these amazing photos that you have and making sure that they reach people uh, in a way that they can, they can be proud to own a, a, mm -hmm. a Chris Koo original? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, with the, some of the, the photos I have, I haven't really seen too many of like that specific stuff. For example, like the backlit bittern. Like if you search up American bittern on like Google or something, like I don't think I've ever seen a photo quite like that. So uh, having unique photos like that definitely helps and uh, having recognitions as well from uh, photo competitions help. Interesting. So like, are you working towards a day where people can go online and buy your prints and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's something down the line. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so how does that sort of work? Like, what is the process to set or, uh Are you not there yet? I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, but I'm just, yeah, setting up the website and... I think mentorships are going to be the first one. That what I'm are mentorships? Talk. So there's a lot of like beginner photographers who would like to know, who would like to learn the camera or like to know more about birding. And I feel like I have something to impart to that and uh, something to teach them and educate them about. So uh, yeah, having a couple of students, like, you know, mentoring them into their goals, into what they would like to see with their photo, their personal pho photographs and photography. I was going to ask if you've thought about it all. And I know I bugged you about the books and the <laughs> podcast, um, but the person I just had on, uh, his name's Tim Srigley, mm -hmm. and he has a YouTube channel um, on um, how to do leather work. Mm -hmm. And he's, I think he's already got something like 4,000 subscribers. Uh -huh. um, and all he does is he does like tips and tricks on this. And then he does another video. And it seems like... Uh, the way that he's chosen, so there's two ways you can go from what he explained with YouTube. The one route is a partnership where they put ads on your videos, but the other way is um, Amazon affiliate marketing, mm -hmm. which is like you tell people where to go find this tool, this thing. Yeah, link to gears. Exactly. Yeah. And you can make money through that as well. Mm -hmm. It just seems like you have a lot of knowledge to share with people on how to bird the the ethics of it like you'd have endless amounts of videos mm -hmm. on how to bird the process for photography like you could you can take it so many different ways that people would be learning from you and you would have that that revenue coming in on and so i'm just interested have you thought about that or is that something that interests you long term because your instagram videos <laughs> if for people just listening go subscribe go uh, follow this person on instagram i'm getting my words confused. go follow him on instagram because his videos are so like it's so unique to know somebody who's doing what you're doing. And I just, um, I admire people like yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, definitely thought about YouTube. Um, the one thing that's kind of keeping me from doing it is like the cost. It's like, oh, it's like a whole new setup with like a tripod or like another camera. I only have one camera and like one wildlife lens. That's the only one I take. Um, so it's like this whole different setup. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something I've, I've thought about and uh, something I could share with other people. 
people have definitely asked me like, hey, you should do YouTube. And like, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I just see oh, such God. value yeah. in pe- like, because then you're building up that community yeah. and you seem to be somebody who wants to share not only like, hey, buy this camera, but hey, do it in this way. Mm-hmm. And like that, th- there's like, there's wisdom tied into the, like it's intelligence of explaining which camera to use, how to use it. But it's a wisdom of like, this is how you do this in the right way. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, um, people typically say like gear doesn't matter um, when it comes to like things like this. I'm like, of course it does. If, if gear doesn't matter, we'll all be shooting with like uh, entry level cameras. Yeah. Um, but gear matters to an extent. So I don't have the latest and greatest gear, but I've learned to like work around um, the limitations of my gear. And so I think anybody can do that with the setup that you have. And yeah, the more you master your camera, the more you're able to like work through like the shortcomings of it. Absolutely. Well, if there's anything I can do to support you (laughs) starting a YouTube channel, um, please let me know because I really admire and I would be a watcher. I would enjoy those videos uh, because I think that there's so like we've learned so much in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Would you mind telling people how they can find you on social media? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram and that's at Chris.Ku, so K-R-I-S dot C-U. And for Twitter, I'm at Chris Ku, so it's just K-R-I-S-C-U. And uh, Birds Canada, how can people connect with that? Birds Canada, uh, you can visit uh, birdscanada.org um, and to your, learn more. And your website? And my website is chrisku.com. So yeah, quite straightforward. Okay, get ready because I really hope he starts <laughs> releasing his uh, his photos for people to be able to purchase and support because I mm-hmm. think what you're doing is so much fun. I think I've learned so much about this. Uh, I'm always excited to like be humbled and be reminded I, I know very little about this world. Mm-hmm. And so when I sit down with someone who's enthusiastic, I think that that's something, again, unique. Perhaps I don't know if it's common in the birding community, but people aren't excited to tell yeah. you about what they know. And you definitely bring that energy <laughs> yeah, okay no thank you so much for having me and yeah it's very i open again yeah really engaging conversation awesome and we just did yeah. three hours and 10 minutes or so nice there we go right on time <laughs> awesome thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>